My entire life has in some way, shape or form been influenced by video games. Games like Fallout 3, several of Skyrim's 500 re-releases at its predecessor Oblivion, the Soulsborne games like Sekiro, the Dark Souls trilogy, Bloodborne, and other flawed but entertaining games have been my escape from reality for over 20 years now. These, among other gems, made up most of my waking hours growing up and I do not regret a second of it. Hello, I'm Browsley, and I want to take you through the main story of one of my favorite games. I remember a friend of mine telling me about this new game he had called Dragon's Dogma, where one could climb every enemy and travel to different locations and battle huge monsters. I remember getting pretty hyped about this, but he quickly turned me off of the idea because he ended with the phrase, but the traveling is so tedious that makes just makes the whole game pretty boring. And me, being the stupid kid I was, took his word for it and held off on buying it for some time. However, his explanation stuck with me, and just the thought of climbing enemies, slaying dragons and acquiring loot just appeals to me. This experience has always been super fun in other games, so why would this game be any different? So after some time, I decided to buy it and give it a shot. However, my feeble mind was not able or prepared for the somewhat slow traversal and poorly expressed narrative. And I remember quitting the game after several failed attempts of escorting the ox through the mountain. And I never really got into Dragon's Dogma until after three or so restarts of the game. After that, it just, it just clicked. The game starts off with you taking control of an arisen called Sylvan and his trusty pawn. Explanation of these terms we will discuss later. Sylvan and his pawn equip their lanterns and start roaming this seemingly abandoned dungeon before a dragon swoops down and makes Sylvan rethink every life choice up until this point. He quickly realizes that trying to fight this beast is quite difficult from his current location and decides to head on further into the caverns. Here he happens upon a rift stone. A magical stone which grants its user a gateway into the realm of the pawns and summons two additional pawns to add to his party. The Arisen and his crew venture forth and find even more goblins. These seemingly intelligent creatures attack our heroes, but the party quickly disposes of the threat. Further in there's a soldier in distress. Savan helps him out, but not without telling him to get his shit together for being overrun by two goblins. The path leads the Arisen to a grand hall where more goblins and harpies reside, and him and his crew quickly disposes of these lowly monsters. Shortly after, a group of soldiers enter from a locked gate and ask them for their aid. Savan follows them and we are introduced to the game's first boss. A chimera with both the head of a lion and a goat, and the snake for a tail. This makes for a grand fight for Savan and his friends. This is also the first place we are able to try out the climbing and fighting mechanics of the game. Larger enemies can be climbed and have different weak spots that can be targeted for greater damage. The chimera for example can have its snake tail targeted and cut off for massive damage. Different enemies have different weak spots that can be exploited just as Savan just did with the tail of the chimera. After some time, Savan manages to defeat the beast and is faced with a giant door opening and the game fades to black before showing us the same dragon as earlier falling from the sky. It awakens and starts flying towards some unknown location. That was a tutorial and a pretty grand introduction to a game in my opinion. After an intro like that, being thrown right into character creation might seem anticlimactic, but I feel like this works quite well. Keep in mind that I'm somewhat blinded by my love for this game, but I will criticize it where I feel it deserves it. I feel like having an intro like that and then shoving the character creation right in your face makes me think the devs thought that this is what you can do, isn't it awesome? Here, create your own and have at it. As past me continues fiddling with the character creation, present me wants to talk about it. The character creation is pretty great in my opinion. All the different ways one can customize your character makes for a whole world of possibilities and I always end up spending way more time creating my character than initially intended. One cool aspect of the character creation is the height and weight stats. 
The bigger and heavier you are, the slower you move, but the more you can carry. The same goes for smaller, lighter characters. They move faster and might fit in places in the overworld where larger characters might not, but can carry less. There is thought to be put in what size your character has. After you created your master works all, you can't go wrong. You are thrown into a cutscene, which I can't show you because copyright, but trust me, it's cool. The dragon from the tutorial swoops in and destroys your hometown, Casardis. And Chad Rook, as the Alpha is, decides to challenge the overgrown lizards. He of course gets slapped into next week and gets his heart eaten because of course he does, before he passes out. Chadrug wakes up some time after the incident with apparently a head trauma since now he hears voices. The dragon tells him about how he should now seek him out and reclaim his heart, and Chad chooses a starting vocation. He can choose between fighter, strider or mage. And since Chad Rook is a better version of someone we will soon meet, he needs to show how it's done and choose his mage before heading out. He gets some talking to from Kina and heads out into the village. Chad Rook heads over to the village gate but gets interrupted by some sounds to his right. Rook descends from a rift in the clouds and greets Chad. Chad then proceeds to be taught about the pawns from Adaro. He's of the Pawn Legion. They come from some unknown place, just appear without a warning. They are a strange lot. Not human, quite. They look the part, sure enough, but they lack the will, the spark what drives us. They have no capacity to feel nor act alone, so they live as cell sorts. Myrmidons, they're called. Hmm. There's an encampment west of the village where men gather to face the dragon. I'd wager a fair number of his kind will be there as well. Why don't you take him? Might be you learn out of why he came to you in the first place. After being introduced to Rook, Chad decides to give the sickly looking doppelganger a shot and proceeds to head towards the encampment. On their way there, they happen upon Reynard, a peddler in dire need of help because he is overrun by goblins. Chad Rook disposes of the goblins, acquires the favor of Renard the peddler, and continues towards the encampment. This road will have us to the encampment air much longer. <clears throat> However, Rook has already shown himself to be quite annoying and Chad Rook has no other option than to unalive him. Please, help me! Once inside the encampment, Chad Rook is startled by Rook's apparent teleportation abilities. He decides to ignore it because he hears a disembodied voice. He follows it to another rift stone. The stone tells Chad to prove his worth as an arisen. Well met, arisen. Can you hear our voice? We speak to you from across great distance. The Horn Legion has awaited you. Pray, forgive this strange and impersonal greeting. This rift serves as a gate. It connects our kind to your world. It opens to the Arisen. For they possess a will powerful enough to guide the Legion. If you would claim to be among the Arisen, prove the strength of your resolve. Chad heads out again and sees a group of soldiers running towards the north gate of the encampment while shouting something about a monster. Chad thinks this is my chance and follows. Outside of the encampment, Chad Rook sees a monstrous being with one eye and large tusks, a cyclops. Rook has somehow teleported once again and Chad feels obligated to aid the poor thing. They fight the cyclops and his accompanying goblins. I grant you fire! 
even though Chad Rook is a greater Rook, he still finds it somehow difficult to dispose of the giant creature. It does however eventually fall and Chad is once again called back to the tent with the Rift Stone. Shall we search the area? The stone tells him that he is indeed an Arisen, a person linked with the dragon by fate and he can now summon his own pawn. We get another character creation identical to the first thrown at us yet again, only this time is for our pawn. And after some time, Chad is happy with his creation. Beautiful. Some random soldier asks Chad and Beach Jesus to train, but none of them need any training, so they promptly ditch his ass and head on out. A female knight named Mercedes seems like she has something interesting to say, so Chad Rook talks with her and she tells him to rest after the battle with the Cyclops. He is shortly after awoken by a rumbling and is greeted with the head of a giant snake that it reveals itself being a Hydra. A large serpent-like monster whose heads grow back if you cut him off. A battle ensues and both Beach Jesus and Chadrook find it difficult to take on the Hydra with their current equipment. Take aim at that head. They fight with all their might and Beach Jesus almost gets eaten. However, they do prevail and get quite the applause for their efforts by the soldiers and Mercedes. She tells them that she needs them to help her escort this chopped off Hydra head to Grand Soren, the capital of the land. Chadrick accepts this, but tells her he needs to check out the area first. After disposing of the Hydra in a flashy fashion, Chadrick proceeds to leave the encampment to explore. He is interrupted by Elvar, who tells Chad that Kina has gone missing. Uh, hold a moment. Is Kina not with you? She was said to leave the village in search of art for your wounds. I thought you accompanied her. These are dark times for a girl alone in the wilds. Chad takes note and heads on back to Chief Adaro in Casardis to learn what has happened. Adara gives Chad Brook Kina's letter, who gives a vague indication of Kina's destination. Beach Jesus and Chad Brook head on over to the Witchwood. The roads are safer than the brush, but still we best stay wary. Disposing of dead weight and dodging overpowered bandits on the way there. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Do you have time to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Hey, don't run from the Lord! Once inside the Witchwood, Chadrick and Beach Jesus find Kina at the clearing up ahead. She needs an escort to the witch's home. Oh, what are you doing? It you came searching for me? The witch lives in the middle of the woods, and the entire forest is filled with magical fog, which can be purged by destroying talismans scattered around the area. After disposing of a few wolves hunting in a pack, Chad, Jesus, and Kina find the witch's house. There, that must be it. Come on, cuz. The party heads on up and talks to the witch. Begging your pardon, but we seek the witch of these woods. Oh? A great and aged woman? Perhaps you might have seen her? The witch? You seek grandmother? Your grandmother? Yes. Where might we find her? I would ask her aid in a dire matter. She is dead. She died, as all must. Oh. What of you then? Know you aught of the dragon? Can you read the worm speak? Gran told me. The faith knows. It cloaks the dragon, cloaks the truth. 
Those who search for truth outside the faith are branded heretic. So... So your grandmother told you not of the dragon, that the faith might leave you be? Yes. Then it seems we must turn to the faith if we are to learn more. You have our thanks. We'll leave you in peace to return to our village. I feel more familiar with this quest now. Kina heads home after the talk, and Chadbrook and Beach Jesus take the opportunity to loot the Witch of all her belongings before heading back to Adaro to complete the quest. Most like the fight. Hello. Chad then remembers that he promised Mercedes to escort the Hydrahead to Grand Soren and heads on over to the rendezvous point. But before he can leave Kisardis, he is interrupted by Madeleine, another peddler in need of escort to the encampment. Chad and Beach Jesus escort the young lady safely to her destination and also helps her financially for some reason. The power of the boner is strong. Now it's on to the rendezvous point to meet Mercedes. She needs escort through the valley, and with the help of Chad and Jesus, this should be a quick endeavor. Well, well maybe not that quick. DO IT! JUST DO IT! Chadwick gets impatient and kicks the ox in frustration. This works surprisingly well, and they fight their way through the valley. <laughs> nimble, watch your back! <laughs> Oh, come on, man. Did it. A fiend with a woman's form. Watch for a goblin ambush ahead, Arisen. Goblin Grand Soren's gates, men. Cock and kick. End it. How is her after they strike? Grand Solon, capital of Gansas. Shall we enter it? They fight their way through the night and finally arrive at Grand Soren. Oh, okay, I guess it's daytime then. So directly to offer my report to his grace. I'll have words sent for you, friend. Pray sojourn in the capital a while. To the castle, men! Step lively! After arriving in Grand Soren, Chad is shown how one can change one's vocation. Vocations are this game's class system. There are several different vocations one can choose from, ranging from the main ones, the fighter, strider, mage, uh, to advanced ones where we have warrior, ranger and sorcerer, and lastly we can choose hybrid vocations, such as magic archer, a hybrid between sorcerer and ranger, assassin, a hybrid between fighter and strider, and lastly the bunk lord, mystic knight which is a sorcerer and fighter smushed together in all its glory. All these different vocations have different stat bonuses on level up. So leveling as a sorcerer for a few levels will give you more magic attack and defense than if you leveled as a fighter the same amount of levels. However, you can change your vocation whenever you want and this makes the character creation even deeper in regards to how many variations of endgame stats one can have. Chad Rook chooses a vocation and gives one to beat Jesus as well and they continue their quest. While Chad Brook settles in Grand Soren, I want to talk about the story and build up so far. Although I have love for this game, it did take me several retries over a couple of years to really get into it, and I believe it's mainly because of the start after the tutorial. The game, after giving you this huge obstacle and quest, kinda just plops you into a random beach and says, here, do the thing. 
it is seemingly pretty high stakes without giving us any time to form any relationships with the people involved. And although this by no means is the only game doing this, yes, I'm looking at you too. After the dragon has left, there really is no rush or feeling of a rush to venture forth and defeat it. You can kind of just lob around doing whatever you want and when you feel like it, get back to slaying the dragon. Although I understand that it's difficult to balance freedom of gameplay and a high stakes narrative. Just something I thought I'd mention. I back to our boys. Chadbrook takes note of what Aslam says and heads on down to the Pong Guild where they are asked to find out what is going on. The duo heads down and notices a light at the bottom. They continue forward and dispose of generic enemies along the way. They happen upon an ogre who has its way with Beach Jesus before Chad disposes of it in great fashion. I'm on my way. So, what do you propose? They find a port crystal and inspect the sanctum before being introduced to an infamous Japanese cartoon and realize they need to escape. As they escape, I want to point out that these tentacle enemies are infinitely spawning. My best man died here about five times before realizing this, so it's something to take note of. They return to Barnaby and explain the situation. A light. In the furthest depths, you say. I see. In truth, even we pawns know precious little of the Everfall. I can say with utmost certainty, though, the light you speak of is newly come. We cannot know if this small aberration will give rise to great calamity hence. After this, they happen upon Sir Duncan, who gives them the wor wor worm hunt license. Summon pawns as necessity demands here at the pawn guild. Are you the arisen? I bring a message from the duke himself. His grace has judged your feet in slaying the Hydra most laudable. To honor your noble works, you are hereby welcome to the worm hunt. You may now accept orders from Sir Maximilian, captain of the hunt. Bring this writ to Sir Maximilian outside the castle gates. He will instruct you further. That document confers the status of hunter upon you. Carry it on your person always. Before heading to the duke, our heroes notice a distraught father in the local smithy. The smith tells them his son is dead and is in need of a wake stone to be resurrected. Chaduk takes note and promises to come back with the stone as soon as possible. Chad and Beast Jesus then head on over to Sir Maximilian for their first orders. Ah, arisen. My men have told me much of you. I have expected your visit. I am Sir Maximilian Eisenstern, captain of the hunt so named by His Grace Duke Edmund Dragonsbane. As I was setting about to find work for you, I came upon this slate. I know not its origin, nor its age, but the writing it bears is old. So old, our men could only read a few words. Dragon, scar, arisen, heart. 
What little we know all points to you, sir. Best you should have it. Our heroes are tasked with deciphering a text on a stone tablet and starts asking around in the city. What do I know of the old writings? Less than I know of modern. Alas, I'm a man of the sword, not the quill. The rest is no script, friend. Just flourish. This slate's no text. It's a cipher. Like as not, it holds some secret meaning to folk those words relate to. I'm not one of them. After inquiring about the whereabouts of someone knowledgeable about the tablet, the duo heads out into Grancis proper and tries to find Hill Figure Null. On their way there, they find snow harpies only previously encountered in the tutorial, and also experience the mythical Grancis texture poppin. Shortly after, they arrive at their destination. Him who knows that I know what he seeks to know, knows it well, while he who knows not, knows not what I know, or know not. Yeah, I, I don't really know either. See me, yes? It appears the person who just spoke is the pawn of a previous arisen, the Dragonforged, who now stands in front of Chadrook and Beach Jesus. He continues to confuse the duo before inviting them into his emerging cave. The Dragonforged then gives them a brief explanation of the tablet and some exposition. Well met, arisen of the present day. New forged link in the grand chain. You have come seeking meaning for that slate and the words it bears. There is none. None save that it brought you here to me. My form can be discerned only by the true arisen. I am the dragon forged. Go now. Bye, have a great time. They then rub the Dragonforge blind and leave. After talking with the Dragonforged and rubbing him blind, our power couple head on back for their text orders. Not a text, you say? A cipher crafted to bring you to the Dragonforged. If this man speaks true and is immortal, there's a fair chance he guided his grace as well. Be that the case, his words are well worth heeding, sir. It would be my honor to show you the ready charges for the worm hunt. The choice is yours. They are tasked to ride out a monster infestation in a castle northeast in Grancis. Certainly. Then here are the details. We have urgent word from the stone of the southwest. A horde of goblins struck the fortress while it was still under repair, and they've claimed it. Though the hold is remote, its importance to our southern defenses is critical. We must reclaim it, and soon. The safety of the entire duchy rides on this matter. I would ask your help in resolving it. You have my thanks, sir. I shall send word to the hold presently. I've sent some of the Duke's swords on ahead already. Meet them there and lend them your arm. I await good word of your success. Careful! A goblet! <laughs> We'll need a light to get through this dock.
They're left exposed after a grand strike. Strength in numbers, Arisen. Falling Goblin is an easy mark. After venturing for what seems an eternity, killing monsters and failing quests, they finally arrive at the Shadow Fort. The duo is briefed about the situation. Well met, sir. I take you for the Arisen. Sir Maximilian informed us of your coming. By your leave, I would ask you spearhead our force here. Our tactics are as such. We aim to strike from the front gate, but lack the time and means to batter down the doors. I ask that you pass through the hole you see there, and lay open the gate from within. I cannot say what may await you within. The danger is great, but I trust you will prevail. And travels through the tunnels leading into the fort barracks. Our heroes dispose of the goblins inside, and head on out to see what type of monsters were lurking inside the fort. In numbers Power couple number one finds a ladder and disposes of the goblins on top of the structure before B. Jesus takes a huge L. And Chad shows some extreme accuracy with the ballista. Chad Brook then parkours over to the other side, chucks the enemies off, and learns about his next objective. He needs to find a lever for the gate. On his way to the objective, Chad Brook encounters the Cyclops, who grabs a hold of B. Jesus. Chad needs to prioritize the mission and goes in to get the lever for the gate. The duo then goes back to the gate to place the lever and let the soldiers in. Splendid work, Arisa. Now, we must rout the beasts for good. After me, man! The Arisen then jumps out of the ballistas and takes out one of the Cyclops, and then finishes off the second one with his own hands. The party then makes the goblins outside retreat and gets access to the fort insides. Chad then encounters a third Cyclops, fights it, beats Jesus, takes off flying, and Chad continues deeper into the fort. He finds the goblin leader and fights it. It babbles something about stupid humans, but Chad cannot relate because he's a god, before getting killed while trying to escape. Beach Jesus is then revived, and the journey leads them back to Grand Soren for the next orders. Ah, good arisen. Word of your victory over the Goblin Horde precedes you, sir. With the fort back in our hands, the south of Grancis is shielded once more. Back at Grand Soren, the duo is tasked to investigate a cult comprised of heretics worshipping the coming of the dragon. They head out to do some investigation in town. While talking to different key persons around Grand Soren, they get a whiff about the cult's whereabouts. The catacombs. Chad and Jesus go out the main gate of Grand Soren and sees a traveling merchant in dire need of help from a pack of goblins. They hurry over to help him and start attacking the goblins. However, not long after, a giant chicken comes down from the skies and attacks our heroes. This four-legged eagle is what's called a griffin. It attacks our heroes with its razor sharp claws and its ability to manipulate lightning. However, 
our heroes heroically fend off the chicken and dispose of the goblins, and head on over to the catacombs. At the arrival at the catacombs, the power couple enter and begin exploring the catacombs. While they investigate, I want to quickly point out the atmosphere. Such foreboding sounds, the undead, the lighting, the caskets with potential to curse the player. I am thoroughly impressed with the way these catacombs convey a sense of despair with showing and not telling. This game really has it all. Complex battle and combat mechanics, tons of curatives and buffs, your mom, and a pretty large variety of enemies. Back with our friends, they have arrived at the secret gathering of the cultists and crashed their party. Is not to be found in pleasure. For pleasure is but another manifestation of the soul's inch awakeness. Nearly there. A distraction for the flesh. Come to join our flock, Arisen. <laughs> Is the answer, dear Arisen? <sighs> Unto all things, death and chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Being the badasses that they are, they quickly defeat the undead and meet the token black guy, who gives them the choice to spare the or execute the captured cultist. He's all yours. As Chad Brook is about to leave the cultist alone, he says something that makes Chad fume and he promptly takes the cultist out. Token comes back, applauding Chad for making such a difficult decision and looks forward to working with him again. He vanishes and the duo travels back to pretty boy Maximilian. Next task is to aid a research party in exploring the water god's altar by the waterfall not too far from Casardis. It will be my honor to show you the ready charges for the worm hunt. The choice is yours. Certainly. Then here are the details. By the Duke's decree, we spare no effort in gathering knowledge concerning the worm. As one arm of that pursuit, we aid the faith in their examination of ruins and relics. One such ruin has of late become home to monsters. We've received a request for escort. They've asked for you by name, sir. What response might I give them? My thanks, sir. His grace has commanded the utmost attention be given to such matters. Pray, speak to Father Geoffrey at the cathedral in the city for details of the task. Were the decision mine, I would set every man we have to defending our strongholds. But such is our duty. They venture forth and talk to the monk who got separated from his colleague. Best choose our path carefully. I'll make her be good. Are you the Arisen, sir? I am of the party sent to survey the ruins. I've seen no sign of Brother Jean. After that, it's into the cave, but not before spending an eternity unequipping and re-equipping the lanterns. Soaked to the bone!
Once inside, they explore. The scholars of the faith leave the water gods altar its day not long ago. It was a place of work in the Exploring the ruins goes pretty quick. Here they fight different types of saurians and other vile creatures. After some time they happen upon the corpse of the monk's friend. Chad and Jesus decide to explore a bit more before rendezvousing with the monk outside and see a cyclops. Creature lurks just beyond. This way! After reading this world of this monocle wearing know-it-all, they notice it dropped a sigil stone of some kind and remember an odd-looking door on their way in. They head back to the odd-looking door and it turns out the sigil stone is a key. This key gives the power couple a passage to a pressure plate that drains the ruins of the water and lets them explore even more. Back to slaying monsters, I guess. They dispose of a variety of enemies before noticing a stone tablet. It looks important, so they keep it. Beach Jesus shows his worth and dies while carrying several tablets. Way to go! Not long after, Chad has seemingly scoured the ruins of all its contents and he heads back to the monk. Turns out the tablets were important. Way to go, Chad. Not at all because I didn't want to go in and out twice. Chad is then asked to give all five tablets to the monk. Realizing that the big hunk of a man still has the remaining tablets, Chad face palms before retrieving him from the rift. They meet up with the monk hand over the tablets, and quest complete. Back to Maximu. You have my thanks, Arisen. I shall break the sad news of Brother Jean's sacrifice to Father Geoffrey myself. It was no fault of yours, sir. You've done your duty by us well, as the Father shall hear. Pray, do not let it weigh upon your heart. Go and tell Sir Maximilian of our success. You have my thanks, sir. Terrible thing what happened to that monk. There was naught for it. The Faith, as all humankind, are victims in the madness wrought by the dragon's coming. That fear of the worm should drive a man to die in pursuit of old stones. <clears throat> I forget myself. At day's end, the Duke has gained more of the knowledge he so ardently seeks. After hearing of the Arisen and his pawn's great work, the Duke wants to meet him in person. The Arisen then travels to the Duke's Domesny. While entering the Domesny, Chad remembers the blacksmith and how he promised to help revive his son. He notes to himself that he should see to that as soon as he is done with the meeting with the Duke. Oh. Well, this is as good as time as any to talk about the side quests, I think. While progressing through the main questline of the game, certain side quests either get unlocked or locked until New Game Plus. These quests can vary from picking flowers for the local herbalists to routing out the Saurian infestation below the village of Casardis. 
or helping some old chap like Reynard along the world of Grancis to some random place on the map for no apparent reason. This game's side quests can be pretty dull, but they do make you venture forth and perhaps notice a few new locations one wouldn't have noticed if, if one hadn't taken the side quest. There's also a difference between the side quests and notice board quests. The notice board quests are shorter and are often the ones requiring you to escort someone and can only be found at, you guessed it, notice boards. Proper side quests, however, are found by approaching NPCs with a green question mark above their head. Many side quests that have been started but not finished before bigger events such as meeting the duke fails and cannot be completed before starting a new playthrough or new game plus. Which is when you start a new game but with the same stats and equipment you had when you finished the game. So... We gotta say sorry to Austin and Willem for forgetting about them. <laughs> Well, I feel like that's enough about the side quests. Chad enters the Demesne and is introduced to the court jester Festi. He guides Chad Rookie through the doors and Chad is greeted with soldiers laughing at him. Turns out that Festi plays basically a dunce cap on him before lodging him in and now even the Duke has a go at roasting Chad. I fear your crown outshines my own. By my command, every road in Grancis shall be open to you henceforth as a member of the world. Hunt. May your efforts help deliver us from the shadow of the dragon. As long as that damnable beast draws breath, I'll fain accept any help on offer. All right. After leaving the Demesne, Chad shows his impeccable peripheral vision and sees the Duke's wife in the garden and decides to shoot his shot. He approaches her and... Oh, oh god, how old is she? Oh god, oh god, oh fuck, oh god, oh... Okay, thank God. My, my. <laughs> Apologies, dear warrior. But to see a face austere as the castle walls adorned with... This... <laughs> Still, tis more agreeable than the endlessly dour air of most of my husband's son swords. Valor dwells in the heart, after all. The brave ought not need their raiment to speak for them at all, no? Chad sweet talks to Duchess and gives her his dunce cap. She is glad for whatever reason, and they go their separate ways. Before Chad Rook is allowed to leave, he is stopped by a soldier and Aldous. They inform him about his free passage within the Domesne except for nighttime visits. A bit of foreshadowing going on there. You were to be allowed free passage into the castle. This right extends only to your person, and you are advised to comport yourself fittingly. A grievous breach in conduct will see you removed from the castle, or worse. You will take your orders from the Duke's Chamberlain, Aldous. Speak to him for further instruction. May the Maker see you on to further glory, sir. How fared your audience with His Grace, Arisen? Aldous Ludric Sorn at your service, sir. I serve as a Chamberlain in the Duke's court. As you may have seen for yourself, it seems His Grace is... unwell. In truth, there is worry enough to make any man's head ache. But I fear he ails of worse than worry. 
Perhaps I ought not speak further on the matter, for my own well-being. I am charged with assigning royal orders, tasks of great import issued by the Duke himself. Pray forgive the bother, but I ask that you come to see me here in the castle whenever circumstances allow you to take on assignment. The future of this war is murky, sir. May your efforts help to bring its end into sight. Our hero goes to Maxiboy and hears him out before backtracking to the Dumesni. He notices the maid of the Duchess and she beckons him to hear her out. She tells him that the Duchess wants him to sneak into her bedchambers after dark and meet her. I bear a message from Milady Eleanor. She would speak with you, sir, in private, if you please. Some would uh, raise an eyebrow at such a request, given Milady's vows to the Duke. I, I trust. Uh, forgive me, Arisen. I must learn to hold my tongue around proper company. Pray, find me tonight in the castle gardens. Chad Rook contemplates this for about 0.2 seconds before accepting. He rushes back to the inn and rests until nighttime and sneaks old Metal Gear Solid Sal into Eleanor's bedchambers. I trust you understand the delicacy of the situation. And well, yes, even innocent conversation could be bent foul were it discovered by others. Pray, walk softly, Arisen. Oh no! Their undying love for each other after their whole two minute conversation 12 hours before is unwavering. Before they can do anything frisky they are interrupted by the duke cockpucking Chad. He barges in and starts choking Eleanor. Sorry! I'm sorry! Chad intervenes and this saves her but... privacy while well, he violates Melini's privacy. Oh, Rook, none of your japes, fool! Summon the guards! Have this villain removed! That bitch sold Chad Rook out and sent him to the dungeons for whipping. Well now, what have we here? Friend of the Duchess, sneaking off to her chambers for a cup of tea. It must be a fine tea. What to come all this way in the dead of night? Or perhaps you seek refreshment of a different sort, like a turn in the sheets with His Grace's own wife. Damn, you're tougher than you seem. 
Perhaps there's aught to this arisen business after all. Our hero wakes up in a cell and is greeted by Eleanor, who apologizes and gives him a skeleton key. Chad then escapes the guards, who apparently are underpaid since they don't seem to give two shits about him escaping. While recovering from his escapades with Duchess Lowly, Chad remembers Kina and decides to visit her in the Abbey. She has now come to terms with that she will forever be in Chad's friend zone and has become a nun. She then tells Chad about her task and about the Blessed Flower. While Chad goes to work, I want to talk a bit about this side quest. This quest gives you the Blessed Flower, an item that doubles the amount of XP you gain as long as you keep it in your inventory. However, if you keep it in your inventory for an entire in-game day, it will wither and stop working. But you can forge infinite amounts of them, and as long as you have the gold for it, you can keep a supply of them in storage. Also, the time for the withering effect resets after putting in storage. So as long as you keep track of the time and regularly store your blessed flower, you can have double XP for as long as you want. This is the reason why I want to do this quest. To later have the option of leveling Chadbrook up as a balanced character, able to do any vocation viably. What? You would give it back to me? Thank you, but there's no help to my training, cuz. My happiness getting flowers from you has not to do with blessings. <laughs> After finishing Kina's quest, Chad, Brooke and Beach Jesus, the team of legends, head on back to Aldous and accept two quests. Number one, to either help to free or convict Forneval in his trial, and number two, to dispose of the griffin ravaging the lands. Chad, Brooke walks over to where Forneval is being held and speaks to him. If you see me through this storm, I'll sell to you at cost for the rest of my days. Tis a generous offer, eh? Now go, and pray put an end to this farce. I am eager to be quit of this confinement. Please, sir. Chad then picks up a ledger praising Forneval, thinking this might help release him during the trial. They then leave the city to deal with the griffin. I had a feeling you might be our escort. Aye, we are the company of elites you're to march with. A poor jest, I know. We'll circle the capital, striking the griffin as we come upon it along the way. We attack when it sets down. It is nothing so clever as to be called a stratagem, but it will work. If you still care to join us after hearing all that, let's be off. After following the band of soldiers, they find themselves on the top of a cliff. The griffin, which presumably is the same our heroes fought earlier, swoops in and starts a fight. I've learned a new way to fight their ink. I've learned a new way to fight their ink. Now, everyone! Quick! Fire is in range! Now, everyone! Clever! However, it flees and the soldiers suggest that it's heading to Blue Moon Tower. So that is where our heroes also are headed. While trekking through the land of Grancis, they fight off many a bandit, harpies, and other feral creatures. The trail towards the tower is treacherous and the duel starts feeling the wind pushing them. After both fighting and running from bandits and other creatures, they finally arrive. This trek was long. Day turned to night, 
and night turned to day. They rendezvous with the soldiers and learn that the tower is filled to the brim with skeleton warriors. Chad charges through and they stand face to beak with the griffin. They try to fight it but to no avail and need to find another way of grounding the beast. The gate is near fallen! Help me! Through here and up the tower stair! Quickly! I have to give praise to Itsuno and his crew for creating such a realistic looking world when it comes to the aesthetics. The castles, the environments and overall feel of the game really makes you feel like you're in a historically correct medieval setting and, and I can just get over how awesome it is. For its strength, I will must not. What in blazes? This is close. Let's face the beast. What in blazes? We're up against mean odds. I'd hope to for heroic death. It comes. This way or is it? Make haste. It is dangerous here. Retreat. Hurry, master. After evading undead troops on their way to the top of the tower, they arrive and begin their final battle against the beast. It shows itself as a formidable foe. However, Chad Brook and Beach Jesus are prepared and manage to ground it by setting it ablaze. Strike with all you have! I know the new way to fight that is. I shall still the mason! After some time, they manage to slay it and return to Grand Soren for their rewards, and completing the trial of Fornival. I've learned more than you in this quest. The beast is slain. Let's return to the capital. <laughs> Chadbrook gives Aldous the ledger praising Fornival and foolishly thinks that this is enough. Time passes and lo and behold, on the basis of too little evidence for his acquittal, Fornival is found guilty and is sent to the dungeons, thus removing the best vendor of the game until New Game Plus. After completely letting Fornival down, because my stupid ass didn't check the wiki for the prerequisites for Fornival's acquittal, Chad Rook is tasked with assisting Sir Mercedes with the mutiny. But Sir Mercedes insisted it be hers instead. She was most adamant. Though she is a knight come in good faith to aid us, she remains daughter to Hearthstone's lord. My thanks, Arisen. Pray go and speak to Sir Mercedes. I take it you've heard. Then you'll know that this task is mine. I'll not be an idle burden on the Duke's hospitality any longer. And surely you've won enough glory, sir. Allow me this one chance to prove myself. You have my thanks. The duo follows her to Windbluff Castle, where several soldiers fight amongst themselves. Gained quest knowledge. We'll work to suppress them here. Although Mercedes was nowhere to be seen on the way to the castle, she now somehow is in front of the Arisen and his pawn and approaches Julian, the knight that was both present while being introduced to the Duke, but also at the Secret Cult meeting. Viper! You colluded with Salvation to work sedition among the Duke's men! Salvation? You place me in ill company. I'm a man of this world. Fantasies of death and redemption concern me not one whit. He removes his masks to reveal absolutely nothing because his armor is way too easy to distinguish. Rose Mercedes and they, um, fight. Why am I speaking instead with a bleating she-goat mocked even by her own men? You will retract those words, sir! <laughs> Else suffer what consequence? Else I shall wash my honor clean in your blood! And you? You will play her second? 
I would welcome the general. <laughs> Stay out of this! He's made an open mockery of me and my homeland! <laughs> the people lose their land, their very lives, to a plague of beasts! You are no knight villain! Pray, think of the morrow. The dragon will come again. To your homeland, and to mine. Who shall stand against it then, if we are spent, all of us, for having held to some ancient pact? What is gained by all our deaths? Not, I say, and not would say your Lord Father. How dare you, sir! I will not suffer such slander! You know it to be true. After a stunning performance from Mercedes, Chad intervenes and disposes of Julian. <laughs> you all the arisen, a debt of thanks, woman. Your she god's pride is lost, but you've kept your head. <laughs> Mercedes is embarrassed and hands Chad Rook her cutlass, which Chad seemingly just places in his back pocket. The duo then heads back to Aldous. It grieves me to report an item was stolen from the castle's stores a few days past. It was a possession of the Dukes and a treasure of the realm, the Worm King's Ring. Back at the Demesne, Aldous tells the Arisen about how negligent the Duke is with his seemingly powerful jewelry and tells him that his ring is missing. Chad then roams the city of Grand Soren in order to gain some insight into what might have happened to the ring and who might have taken it. Chad Rook quickly learns that the sorcerer Salomet might have stolen the ring and they head on over to his last known location. Salomet doesn't seem surprised by the Arisen's arrival and initiates a fight. Well, well. <laughs> the Arisen, toast of all Grand Soren, does the work of all mankind's savior truly afford the time to go hunting petty thieves? If you insist on a game of cat and mouse, what say we see which role you'll view? <laughs> Too bad the mercs Salomet has hired are weaker than the roaming rabbits of Grancis. Oh, the cat has claws, and more grit than the fools in the Duke's guard are grunt. But alas, I have not the time for game, sir. Farewell. After fending off the hired mercs, Salomet vanishes and our heroes are later let in on information that tells them that Salomet is most likely retreated to Blue Moon Tower. Luckily, Chad Brook had the foresight to place a port crystal outside of the Blue Moon Tower gate and they teleport there ASAP. Once there, our heroes dispose of the roaming foes and venture forth onto the summit of the tower, where Salomet goes full meme nation. King Priest is a talisman of incomparable character. The vessel worthy of housing the whole of my men. What sublime beast on sight? Heady rapture. Yes, I will see my dream made reality. My essence, my very soul will inhabit the ring of the the life everlasting! Marie! Marie! 
After not being the climactic boss battle one would expect, Selmet falls off the edge and conveniently loses the ring right at the ledge. Our power couple return to Aldus, return the ring and is promptly ordered to head on over to the bridge by the water god's altar. They use their eternal fairy stone and arrive only to be told to return to Grand Soren because of an attack. Arisen! Urgent word from the capital, sir! You are to return to Aldus' side with all possible haste! Once back in Grand Soren, our dreadful duo sees a giant rooster attacking the shipment of the day. This is what's called a cockatrice, a large quadrupedal rooster slash griffin type beast. Chadbrook and Beach Jesus charge head on and begin fighting the overgrown chicken. Beach Jesus, being the scholar and badass he is, proves to be of virtually no use during this fight. While riding the cock, Chad overhears Sir Tolf. No, I don't know who that is either. Rambling about how the salvation is coming and how his plan worked. However, the fight drags on and both the Arisen and his pawn are stumped as they do little to no damage to the beast. Luckily, Beach Jesus reminds Chad of his blast arrows and Chad let him rip. These do massive damage and not long after the cockatrice flees, leaving Chadbrook and Beach Jesus victorious. What damage have I wrought in carelessness to allow an agent of salvation through? And in sending you away before the creature was revived, the damage was all the greater. While I, in my fool credulity, ran to the castle only to be knocked insensate by some villain. It was a lucky thing the beast was kept from the residential quarter. Ugh, or the castle. We must rethink the practice of tribute to prevent such a happening again. For now, though, the danger has passed. What of the damages? Order has been restored, though not without casualty. A few of the trophies were lost. An unavoidable fate given the circumstances. No doubt. You have my thanks, Arisen. Your aid spared us greater loss. The beast is slain as well. In truth, tis fine work. Still, I know you capable of greater feats. May your next victory be grander still. Hail Arisen. Good news. His Grace has taken notice of your feats and selected you to lead an expedition. It is a difficult task, but of critical importance to the defense of the front. The Duke was adamant that none would do so fine as you, sir. The journey will take you afar, Arisen. If you've tasks to complete or personal matters to attend to, pray, do so now. It is like you will not see Grand Soren for some time. Then come. The Duke wished to see you before you set out. He starts following Aldous resists the urge to dispose of some garbage, and enters the solar. It seems the duke suffers some sort of memory loss since he does not seem to remember Chad trying to bone his wife. The office of Arisen brings with it equal parts strength and ambition. I am greatly pleased by your work, sir. I would see you rewarded for all you've done. Come, follow me. I have aught to give you before you set out. He follows the duke in what has to be the world's slowest walk. There's no call for humility, sir. Take it. The expedition will no doubt hold its share of dangers. May the Maker speed your steps. And robs him blind before taking the Paladin's mantle. A soldier barges in and tells the duke about an attack on the fort in Barta Crags. Urgent news, your grace. A messenger has come bearing word from the Great Wall. 
the hold has fallen to a man calling himself the leader of salvation. He's taken captives and threatens to offer up a grand sacrifice to see the land cleansed. The expedition will keep arisen. Head for the Great Wall at once, and quash Salvation's designs afore they're realized. This matter takes precedence over all others. Now go. Heading out of the Demesne, Eleanor's caretaker tells Chad that Eleanor has been locked up in a castle up north in Grances, and begs the duo to help her escape. The bare mention of Eleanor gives Chad Rook flashbacks. I banished my Lady Eleanor to the lonely northern mans. Now she fears her husband will have her killed. Her very life is in jeopardy, Arisen. We must take our next move before his. We plan to flee and seek refuge in our native Melois. Please, well, Arisen, make we... for the manse and find the Duchess, the Duchess, else she Sneak find an assassin. No! <laughs> On their way to the Great Wall encampment, our heroes dispose of many foes. And by dispose of, I mean either running away from or chasing. Upon arrival at the Great Wall encampment, they stock up on resources and head on in the giant gate. Once inside, they are greeted with two armored cyclops and an army of snow harpies. The duo remembers they throw blasts and quickly dispose of the threat. Onward they march and fight several armored skeletons and skeleton sorcerers. They make their way through the castle and find a soldier trapped by a large chimera and a battle ensues. Mad! Salvation is mad to conjure up such monsters! They'll be eaten! Sure as the rest of us! Forgive me, sir, but I'll not open this door. I'll not be food for those beasts. You dare attack me! After unaliving the Chimera, they have finally caught up to the cultists. Ah, the Arisen. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> it would seem our fates are closely bound. The honeyed sleep of destruction will find this place, and all the world in its turn. Indeed, the coming night ill needs us, its faithful harbingers. <laughs> Just as you and your hubris cannot hope to stop the divine beast that mocked you, before its might you stand as useless and frail as this ungainly contrivance of brick and mortar. Nonetheless, the trice you might delay the dragon's coming is blasphemy just the same. But first they shall peel the flesh from your bones, my dear Arisen.
Chadbrook is taken aback by this type of sorcery, but his will to fight is not budging. Chad and Jesus destroyed the whites and notice Elysian on top of the tower. How the little dude managed to get up there in such a short amount of time is still discussed among scholars around the world. I fear I have misjudged the extent of your skill, dear Arisen. I see it was folly to worry of walls and armies while you still live. However, <laughs> it seems my regret will be short-lived. Don't you feel it? The very air dances around us! <laughs> the long night is come! The dragon's reign at last begins! Oh. <sighs> Winged death! All oh, powerful and merciless Gregory! Behold, you unrepentant blasphemers! This is absolute truth! He begins his grandiose and compelling speech and. Ho ho ho! The rantings of an upjump zealot make for tedious listening. His ilk serves no role in what is to come. Only my death will staunch the flood of destruction. A task still far beyond your means. If you would face me, Seek me out, and I shall allow it. But heed the zealot's lesson well. When the weak court death, they find it. Until then, I shall hold your little keepsake safe. Your dragon forged will speak for my diligence in that. The choice falls not to me, nor to the whims of fate. It is yours alone. Ugh. The Arisen and his pawn somehow survives and is compelled to head on back to the Dragonforge for some more exposition. The hour is come, Arisen. The door lies open. Seek the temple atop the Tainted Mountain. Beyond the Great Wall. At its pinnacle, in the shadow of the Worm, Keeper of the Endless Ring, you will make your choice. What you there become, only you can decide. After learning of the prophecy, our heroes return back to the Great Wall encampment.
Chadbrook and Beach Jesus push through the castle and enter an odd looking gate. They find themselves in a place that somehow looks familiar even though none of them has ever stepped foot there before. Here the right will end, Master, and with it, our vigil. Strange Saurians reside in these parts. It aims to hide itself. A new type of Saurian resides in these hills and provides a formidable foe. Chad Rook has lost his glasses, and Beast Jesus gets confused. It's Pushing onwards to the dragon's domain, our heroes dispose of several strong foes along the way. If this path leads to the dragon's roost, we'd best be careful indeed. Now, easy in these parts. Is that all you have for me? The Saurians residing in these parts prove to be quite a challenge, but the beasts are no match against button mashing. One final looting spree before the grand antechamber, which holds some succubi. Chad Rook contemplates where the hell he managed to lose his glasses and gets assaulted by one of them. I'll aid you at once. Great job, Beach Jesus. Shortly after, our heroes are faced with hellhounds, a formidable foe with fiery breath and agile movement. No, they hold the advantage. <laughs> We have triumphed. After clearing the antechamber, Chad and Jesus proceed even further, entering a grand chamber which is home to a gore chimera. What the fuck is that? A fucking cat? An even deadlier version of the chimeras fought earlier. After what seems like hours, Chad Rook decides to lure the Chimera onto the pressure plates situated around the chamber. This leads to a giant door opening and the duo flee from the beast. Also because I've already died like three times or so to this, so I couldn't be bothered to do it again. That Chad then enters and is confronted by Grigori. What is your purpose here, Arisen? If you sought to live, you had naught but run and hide yourself away. But then, tell me, child of man, what does it mean to live in truth? <clears throat> to wage war against the passing of days? To pray to the unseen for a few breaths more? To raise grand cities from stone and spawn new life in turn? Mankind has done this, yes, and more. But is the tapestry you weave truly of your own design? Ah! We eat when hungry, and we sleep when tired of eating. We kill them as we want them dead. Their kind is easy to fathom. They go on living from simple fear of death. Some welcome the end with arms outstretched, while others come to face death incarnate, arms in hand. 
I ask again, what is your purpose here, Arisen? One path to your survival lies in my defeat. Still my heart, and you stay the coming end. Another path before you is to offer up that which you hold most dear. Abandon all delusions of control. For the price of a single life, I shall leave this land in peace. As my vanquisher, the duchy would bow to you. Wealth and power are sweet anodyne for heartache. You'll not gainsay my terms are more than generous. If it matters aught, the man who rules this land now won that honor through just such a bargain. The decision is yours, Arisen. Now, choose. Chadrook thinks to himself for a moment before stepping forth and saving Kina. Grigori takes this as a challenge and the fight begins. Though I called you here to me, it was ever your own feet. You would face me then. Ah, tis a fool's choice arisen. But better fool than Craven, I knew your mind ere you came. Still, I ask this final time. Arisen, will you stand and fight? Your choice is made, Arisen. As you have willed it, so shall it be. That's a way for now, this way! But not before turning into Temple Run for a short amount of time. Eat 
to await you, risen, yearning here within me. <laughs> The hour for turning back is past. The world will have its answer. You or me. Death or life beyond. You gain aught. Give your home here and now. Such is the contest you have chosen. Mind those fangs! At long last, Chadwick and Beach Jesus finally slay the dragon, and we are shown a huge gaping hole destroying a large portion of Grand Soren. The age of the dragon forge catches up to him and he turns to dust. And the duke rapidly ages.
Grigori turns to ash and our heroes and Kina travel home back to Kassardis. After finally defeating Grigori, the Arisen, Chad Rook, wakes up in his... What? What, what happened? Why? Why? Oh, oh god, don't tell me I need to fight him again. Oh, oh, thank god. 200 hours in this game, and this is the first crash I've ever experienced. Chad Rook recovers from the crash and is told that he and his pawn are needed in the capital. They hurry over and while Beach Jesus is stowed outside like a horse outside a saloon, Chad walks in and is greeted by a noticeably older and more frail duke. You... you met with the dragon? And don't think for a minute I don't know what you did then. I... I of all men! could fell that beast! No. You took the dragon's bargain! You conspired with it to wither me and usurp my seat as Duke! But you'll not be quit of me <sighs> so easily! It seems the years of youth he was rewarded as part of the dragon's bargain has caught up to him now that the dragon is dead. He accuses Chad of also taking the dragon's bargain, and thus is after the title of the duke. He attempts to attack Chad, but Chad just toys with the now incredibly frail duke. The dragon gets through breath. But you, black covetous wretch, have it. I'll not give it up, not to you. After checking the old man out the window, guards show up and are visibly and understandably confused. The Duke accuses the Arisen of being responsible for the destruction of Grand Soren and orders his guards to attack him. What devilry is at work here? Devilry indeed. And high treason. This brigand has joined a... A covenant with the dragon, and struck me with a curse! He would tell you the beast is dead. Lies! He has become its minion, spreading evil upon this land as upon its ruler! Just look! Uh, 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 upon the hellish wall that gapes where once our city stood! And tell me, this is not the work of the dragon's dark magic? <coughs> <laughs> Seize this traitor at once! Chad makes a superhero escape and runs out the gate. 
Once outside, Chad sees a visibly upset Maximu, who then begins attacking the duo. I knew you for a villain! Are you alright? I've suffered your avarice and They're deceptions out of succession. deference to the office of Arisen! <laughs> they escape and reach the giant hole that swallowed an entire district of Grand Soren after the death of Grigori. Staring back from this world's utmost depth. They somehow clumsily fall into the abyss and by some miracle manage to grab onto a ledge. <laughs> oh my god, the animation is impeccable. If you would heed my call, prove now your worth. Show that you've the strength to break the yoke that binds you. Here, the power couple is introduced to Kins, who tells them that this is the Everfall and that in order to have the chance of ending this cycle, Chad and Jesus need to collect 20 wake stones. Please, take this. My mistress gathered their like as she sought her way through the depths. She died as she was done. If you would take up her task, pray bring them here to me. I trust that you will see my mistress' will done. If only the blacksmith's son could have waited a bit longer. Chad and Jesus venture forth and enter the first chamber of the Everfall, the aptly named Chamber of Confusion. Here they finally see the culprit behind the Japanese adult film when they first entered the pit below the pawn guild. <laughs> Open. The tentacle monster proves to be quite the difficult foe for our heroes, but Chad came prepared to the Everfall. He brought blast arrows, or also known as pay to win arrows. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. Onward to the other chambers, the duo of doom tangles with a horde of different but yet familiar foes. All while collecting wake stones and wake stone shards for kids. Sometime after entering the Everfall, Chadbrook grabs an ominous looking ledge. He enters and is faced with a huge arena. Definitely a boss room. The chamber fills Chadbrook with dread as well as excitement as he is overwhelmed by a vision. The vision transports Chadbrook to another universe, where Sorcerer Chad, Beach Jesus, Nilly and Chunk Lord are inside the Chamber of Lament, the home of the Erdragon in the Everfall beneath Grand Soren. The Erdragon has two forms of sorts, an online form and an offline form. The online Erdragon has an incredible amount of health and individual Arisen and their parties will not have the power to deal enough damage to defeat it in a single round. 
Instead, the battle continues across the worlds of all Arisen, with them collectively contributing to the defeat of the creature. Defeating the Ur-Dragon online ultimately requires multiple encounters over the course of its life, but all players who inflict damage on the Ur-Dragon are eligible to receive rewards. Over time, as players contribute their efforts towards the common goal, the Ur-Dragon's global health will decline. Eventually, when it's killed, the Ur-Dragon will go into a grace period, where it will repair with very little to no health, and 1 to 15 of its hearts will be brightly lit. If anyone enters the Chamber of Lament during the grace period, they will have a chance to kill the Ur-Dragon and obtain great rewards along with other loot, and every item currently equipped on the Arisen will become Dragonforged. As you can see, the Ur-Dragon is quite weak to holy damage. The offline one is more of a basic battle where it has less health and it's only the reason and their party that does the killing. To fight the Ur-Dragon offline, you either have to have no internet or uh, choose play offline in the main menu. The Ur-Dragon has 30 weak spots all over its body, and only when all of these are destroyed, it is defeated. After a kill, the reward cutscene will play, displaying the reward chamber with several loot bags, some of which will be randomly selected Ur-Dragon weapons. The three items comprising the abyssinal armor set and one of the four face masks, as well as an array of 20 wake stones. The fight also has sort of a time limit of around 8 minutes, where if not killed before the 8 minutes are up, the Ur Dragon will flee. However, when offline, it's simply to leave the chamber and then return, and the dragon will reappear. On screen now, you can see the online requirements for the different rewards, as well as random rewards. Nice. I really love this fight. The chamber looks incredibly ominous, and then the dragon descends and looks like the rotten corpse of the Grigori. Its name suggests it's the first dragon, and therefore the ancestor to all other drake and dragon kind, which I find really cool. All of a sudden, the ground begins to shake, and the fabric of space time rips. Ultimately, showing Sorcerer Chad seven different universes, all with a version of him sporting a different vocation and tactic when defeating the mighty Ur-Dragon. As Chad has already shown us, a sorcerer or a mage with a holy magic bolt is pretty much melts the poor thing. Our Chad Rook chooses the universe and is instantly in the universe of the Assassin. The Assassin is the vocation with the highest strength growth and Ur-Dragon Assassin strategies generally rely on leveraging high strength and attack power for maximum damage. The skills Invisibility, Bloodlust and Autonomy have been pretty heavily nerfed since the release of Dark Horizon compared to the original release, and therefore are less effective than they were. Still, the tactic on the wikis are still very viable. Assassin Chad rids himself of his pawns to trigger Autonomy, and then sleeps till nightfall to trigger bloodlust. After these preparations, he enters the Chamber of Lament with his weapons equipped, and kills the pawns and waits for the Earth Dragon. Once it has landed, Assassin Chad equips the Maker's Finger he bought from Fornival and shoots it at the Earth Dragon. He does a direct hit, but since he forgot to wait for the Earth Dragon's initial roar, it cancels out the Maker's Finger. If done correctly, however, the Earth Dragon should be stunned temporarily. Now he drugs himself with Conqueror's Periouts and blasts the Earth Dragon with tons of blast arrows. The wikis chose a more stylish trick involving Liquid Whims, Periouts and becoming invisible. I'll post the link in the description. I honestly find it easier, although it doesn't look like it, to just blast it with arrows. This is the offline variant of the Earth Dragon. It also flew off a couple times, but Assassin Chad just left and returned for the Earth Dragon to respawn. And done. Now onto the fighter verse. Fighter Chad lacks any fast climbing attacks as well as any viable range attacks, making the Earth Dragon a difficult battle. Nevertheless, Fighter Chad can defeat the Earth Dragon, or will online make a significant contribution to his downfall. Needless to say, you will need a good sword when fighting the God of Dragons. Fighter Chad here is blessed with a carnation, unupgraded in all its glory. You should equip some climbing augments as well 
specifically those which improve speed or as Chad here have, tons of stamina augments, as well as adhesion which makes it more difficult for the Ur Dragon to chuck him off. As with every fight when battling a huge monster, I, Fighter Chad and the wikis suggest parry apts. Tons of them. Just, just stack them. Also the skill Heavenward Lash is optional to hit the wingtips from the ground. Well, as you can see Chad has no chance of hitting them. A mage or sorcerer pawn to cast holy enchantment is also a wise choice. The strategy is pretty much to climb on and hit the hearts until destroyed. However, the key issue is the aforementioned wingtip hearts, which cannot be reached by climbing. There are a number of methods on how to deal with these, however. It's the skill I mentioned earlier, the Heavenward Lash, when the Ur Dragon is casting or trying to possess a pawn, or alternatively, you can rely on hired pawns for the hearts the fighter cannot reach, as you can see Fighter Chat is done here. Fighter Chat has also equipped BGs with tons of blast arrows, which BJ has no issue unloading onto the Ur Dragon while Chunk Lord and Ludovic also gank the poor thing. Time flies and poof, Ur Dragon is now Ur Dead. Nailed it. On to the Warrior Verse. Warrior Chads possesses the weapons with the highest base damage output, but lack the range combat, therefore they cannot reach the hearts on the wings except under very limited circumstances, much like the Fighter Chads. Powerful weapons are essential for the Ur Dragon fight, and the wikis bring up weapons like Dwells in Light and Angel's Fists as good standards. However, due to a traditional warrior's usual high strength and low magic, these holy enchanted weapons are not the most effective against the Ur Dragon itself, despite the creature's innate weakness to holy. The wikis then suggests using the Dragon's Flight weapon as it is lauded as the best weapon in Dragon's Dogma to use against the Ur Dragon. Therefore, Warrior Chad has bought it from the Black Cat in Grand Soren and upgraded it as far as his materials would allow him. Warriors are capable of doing high damage to the hearts, and are relatively stable when climbing, and are also capable of staggering the dragon. The issue with this class, as with the fighter, is its difficulty hitting the wingtips. Breaking these two can often take as long as the time taken to destroy the dragon's other 28 hearts. Therefore it is recommended for the warrior to take very high powered rangers or striders to shoot down the higher wing and tail hearts of the offline Ur Dragon, and hope that the online Ur Dragon spawns with no high wing hearts during grace in order to effect an easier kill. Warrior Chad went with the same approach as in the fighter verse and got help from a few friends to deal with the tough to reach hearts. After the warrior fight, it's on to the aim assist verse. This is an effective strategy for the offline Ur Dragon for both versions of the game, and not as much for the online Ur Dragon. As soon as the dragon lands, aim assist Chad fires off Hunter Bolt repeatedly until it drops to the ground. The wiki recommends items such as the Heaven Ski and at a minimum a bow as strong as Dragon's Quickening. Aim Assist here has had the RNG god on his side, and has actually managed to get the dragon's quickening. The gods have not been as kind to give him the Blackwing bow though. Liquid Wim and other stamina curatives should be used to allow continual attacks with Hunter Bolt. The Magic Archer's attacks require very high magic, so Aim Assist Chad makes great use of Salamence Secrets, as these are recommended more highly over the other boosters as four of these will boost the entire party's magic attacks, instead of just the individual Arisen's magic. His homing arrows make it easier to target the Ur Dragon's hearts, and after some time struggling with keeping up with the stamina drain, aim assist Chad and his crew are victorious over the Rotten Dragon. Now it's on to the Mystic Verse. For the Mystic Knight, it is recommended you set up at least one Ruinous Sigil and Great Cannon Trap for the Ur Dragon to land in. Still, it is useful to set up pairs, as the Ur Dragon is intelligent enough to position itself upon landing to avoid them. Mystic Chad also makes sure that he buffs himself after the Ur Dragon's introduction roar, as this cancels out all buffs done before. Mystic Chad also makes sure that he always has at least one great cannon and sigil on the field at all times. At the same time, he makes sure that he also have his shield charged with blitzed repulsed. It is particularly important when you know the Ur Dragon is casting its own holy fur. 
Perfect blocking the Ur Dragon spell with a charged magic shield with at least one great cannon and sigil on the field does significant damage to the Ur. Since I am an old geezer, I have equipped the augment which makes perfect blocking easier. Also, since I am a really old geezer, I never even managed to perfect block it. Although I guess I didn't really need to do that, since the sigils, cannons and pawns make pretty swift work of the dragon. And before long it's gone. On to the ranger verse. For the ranger there is little to no need to climb, and since ranger Chad has a strength stat of over 300, and is a reasonably accurate shot, he's positive he'll come out of this unscathed. However, Ranger Chad does need a ton of Tadjutus Miracles, as these will boost the strength of the whole party. And since he has a caster on his team, he also made sure to stack 4 Salamid Secrets. These will boost the caster's magic attack. Ranger Chad also made sure to bring a few Liquid Wimps with him, to fuel his stamina as well as lots of Blast Arrows. And I mean lots. As you can see, Ranger Chad doesn't really need any other weapons to deal damage to the Ur Dragon, and therefore one can feel free to bring any type of daggers for a potential dragon forging. Lastly, Ranger Chad loads everyone in the party to overload with blast arrows. His pawns are now his mules. And since rangers use 10 blast arrows per 10 fold shot, he won't be overburned for very long. It is, as you can see, completely possible to shoot the dragon to death with this strategy. Lastly, over to the Strider verse. Strider Chad's strategy for defeating the Ur Dragon can both be the exact same as Ranger Chad's or a more hands on approach. If you're just setting out for your first online kill, wear your best and strongest armor, and if you're vulnerable to magic attacks, stock up on magic defense curatives or tools, such as Decoction of Pendility or Mage's Periapts which also stack up to 4 times, because you'll be a sitting duck for the Earth's holy fur while you're climbing. Group creatives or tools are also highly recommended over parry apps, as they apply to the entire party. Strider Chad has equipped himself with specific dragon killing augments, such as Clout, Vehemence, Acuity, Attunement, Opportunism, and Bloodlust. These augments grants him the greatest boost to damage output from both physical and magical base stats. He loads up on curatives and loads the whole party to narrow over encumbrance with blast arrows. He also made sure that he is stocked up on liquid whims and tageless miracles. Destroying which hearts in which order can be important. It is recommended to shoot blast arrows as soon as the Ur Dragon lands. However, group strength and magic boost potions should be saved until it either flinches the first time or finishes roaring, because as mentioned before, the Ur Dragon can and will cancel curative effects and set boosts applied prior to its initial roar. Once you're ready, just let him rip. And before long, it's dead. After some time, Chadwick steps out of the multiversal vision and continues delving into the Everfall, with Beach Jesus close behind. Beach Jesus proves to be quite valuable in the Everfall and makes minced meat out of a number of foes in the different chambers. Soldiers Chadwick, they both seem to become accustomed to the senseless killing and slaughter. After some time, Chad and Jesus have finally managed to procure the 20 wake stones to open the portal. The wake stones are then handed over to Kins, and she opens up a large whirlpool and tells Chad to jump in. Yes, at last. At last you've gathered the whole of them. With them, you can summon forth a rift of considerable power. 
This rift, born of the Wakestone's power, will guide you forward, Arisen. I fear there will be no returning to this place. Are you prepared to end this, Arisen? May the world be put right by your hand. I feel more familiar with this quest now. After skydiving into the rift created by the Wake Stones, Chadrook finds himself face to face with the Seneschal. Basically God, for what I've gathered at least. The Seneschal challenges Chadrook's will to survive and they begin their fight. Well met, Arisen. I'll not waste time on rhetoric. Defeat me and take my place as keeper of this world. You saw it awaiting you at the end of your descent. Aye, the same world you've traveled to arrive at this place. A world you may well now inherit. It is a simple proposition. No different than any you've faced. You need only the will to claim what is offered you. To survive. Yes, fight to risen as you earn a fort in country. However, the Seneschal has not taken into account that Chad Rook is a god himself and gets pretty much beaten to a pulp. Just as you call forth pawns, so I command all life into existence. Call it divine creation if you must, but expect none of the mercy men seek in their gods. This is cold truth, the unbending reality of a world without compassion. The world and all its denizens are but empty vessels. In that regard, no different than the pawns. Without volition, there is no true life. The world falls stagnant, dead as an ocean with no current to guide it. That volition is tempered by the struggle for survival. The decision, just like yours, to fight. Just as the pawns need a master's command, so the world thirsts for the will to live. Let us continue, Edwisen. Show that you are more than an empty vessel, animated by forces unseen. Worth enough to fight for! It is time to decide. Will you claim your right as a wizard? Or shrug the burden and seek peace in oblivion? Just so. One foot after the next, come what may. That is what it means to live. Turn back now and I will grant you a merciful death. The choice is yours, Arisen. 
Yours alone. Tis a simple choice arisen. Step forward or retreat. Accept the quiet emptiness of a false peace, a false life. After a short cutscene where Chad Brooks' mind is blown away by some sick meta shit, he is faced with an option of retreating from the fight and living the rest of his life in an illusion. Shadrook has no qualms of taking the mantle of badass once more and pushes through all his friends, family and acquaintances along the journey. That's a might harsh, I Ever the noble like you. <laughs> You're not without a home to return to. It's <laughs> too great an honor for one of my stature. Why this hesitation, sir? You've ought to protect, do you not? This. Why? This is what your is it answer. you, sir? I would beg you rest a while yet. Instead, I ask only the. Goodbye. I was always so afraid. All I asked was to be at the side of those I loved. All I ever asked. Chad reaches the Seneschal, and they duke it out once more. You are close now. So very close to me. Come, Arisen. I shall meet you on your own terms, joined by my own companions of old. You stand now at its end, Arisen. See your journey through. Turns out the Seneschal actually is Savan from the tutorial, and now Chadbrook and Beach Jesus have to defeat him and his pawn. Oh, this is gonna be epic. After two or three strikes, both Savannah and his pawn are defeated. Yeah. Arisen. Forgive me. All I've done is to test your will. It is the fate of all arisen. You and I are swept up in the current, same as the rest. Each tempers the volition of the next, and the endless cycle continues. And so, until the coming of a new soul, fit to craft the will to live. Someone like you. Until that day, may you guide the world ever justly. Present you with the God's Bane Blade. Those who arise to oversee this world are undying, save by this brand's kiss. <laughs> I ask that you, as the world's new seneschal, use it now to vouchsafe freedom to your weary servant. <coughs> Mourn me not, for I welcome the release. At long last, I am free of eternity, of infinity, free of the cruel, unending ring.
The defeated Savant tells Chad to pierce his heart to help him out of the cycle. Once that is done, Chad now has access to the throne of the Seneschal. He sits down and is transported to Kisardis. However, he can no longer interact with the world anymore. So that was a fucking lie. He leaves and is transported to Grand Soren instead. However, the problem still persists. This does not sit well with Chad, and he decides to use the same blade he killed Savan with to end his own life. After performing seppuku and falling to the floor of the Seneschal's domain, Beast Jesus approaches Chadrook in disbelief. Whilst crouched over the body of his master, the ground below opens up and they both fall down to the ocean. You're not... Your face is his, but you're not. No, but he's here now. Still, I... I'm sure of it. There's no denying that I'm pretty influenced by my love for this game. However, I have tried my best to point out flaws I feel are worth pointing out. I don't know how many times I've completed this game, but I learned something new each and every playthrough. The way the story is set up has potential, but the juggle of side and main content makes the main mission seem less important since there's really not any time limit other than the way some started quests fail if you progress too far into the main game as pointed out earlier. Also, there's several alternative endings. And I say endings loosely here since after each credit roll you get a prompt to retry. Firstly, you get one ending for taking the dragon's offer and leave your beloved behind and take the mantle as the Duke of Grancis. Then you will renounce your bond with this human and make an offering of their death. I shall not judge you, Arisen, for weakness is your nature as a child of man. I ask this final time. Your choice is made, Arisen, as you have... Secondly, you can get one ending if you by some miracle manage to die by the hands of the Seneschal. I'll, I'll just show it to you.
And thirdly, you can accept the Seneschal's offer to live in the dream and then you get this ending. Did you as well. So be it. Go and seek your peace. Your guttering beacon in the churning dark. And I shall await the coming of the next. Overall pretty cool lore bits that show us that the duke took the dragon's offer and the bit earlier where he choked Eleanor while shouting some other name, he was perhaps remorseful of his past choice of abandoning his beloved. And dying by the hand of the seneschal makes you the next dragon tossed to find the next risen to take the seneschal's place in an eternal loop. Living in the dream just makes the seneschal disown you with a disappointing stare. After defeating the mighty dragon Grigori and taking the mantle as the Seneschal, Chad Rook experiences a dream he has never had before. He has visions of distorted beasts never before seen, even an intangible form looking like death itself. His visions foreshadows a mighty foe and several fantastical beasts in a land far off somewhere unknown. He sees countless lifetimes, countless journeys of experience and fighting, Countless cycles of the dragon's coming, its subsequent defeat, and becoming Seneschal. Only for it all to repeat. And yes, I realize I'm taking some artistic liberties with canonizing the new game plus system of this game. He wakes up and thinks to himself that it all seems familiar but he still can't put his finger on this uneasy feeling. He feels different, stronger, as if he himself has experienced all these countless lifetimes. That can't be, he reasons to himself. Still, the dream he just had murmurs in the back of his mind and the deja vu he's experiencing is making him uneasy. Chad, however, eventually gets up and follows his instincts. He picks a vocation and heads on out, where he overhears a familiar conversation. You say it left a glowing scar? Yes. The wound has closed, and it seems the worst has passed, but... His heart lies silent. If you would face me... Adara and Kina talk about the scar on Chad's chest, the way it glows and how his heart now lies still. Adaro exclaims that this is ill magic and that one needs to be careful with such things. He then leaves to talk to someone else about this and orders Kina to keep an eye on Chad. You should be abed. I wish you would not strain yourself so. I'm worried for you, cuz. Another deja vu. After his talk with Kina, he continues out and follows the path all the way down past the inn and towards the village gate. He sees a familiar face popping out of the sky and gets berated with knowledge he already feels he possesses. Chad and the Waste of Space follows the trail to the encampment, enters a conversation with the Rift, 
slaughters the Cyclops and is reacquainted with the long lost bay. The trio then talks with Mercedes and rests. A Hydra appears and they dispose of it. It all feels way too familiar for the dreams to only be dreams. Also it all feels way easier than it should. Chad Rook finally snaps out of what could only be described as a trance and remembers the visions of the mysterious place. He follows his instincts and heads back to Kisardis, disposing of some trash along the way. Once there, the duo searches the whole day for some sort of clue as to how to get to the mysterious location Chad Rook had visions of. Day turns to night and suddenly they notice a strange figure on the pier. They head on over and are introduced to Orla. She urges Chadrook and BJ to follow her to what she refers to as the Bitter Black Isles. And so, a new adventure begins. You. You can see me. Then you are one known to the dragon, bound within the Eternal Ring. I have dire need of the Arisen Strength. Please, sir, will you lend me your aid? You have my eternal thanks. You speak now to a Shadow of Sorts. My flesh resides elsewhere. I would take you there now, if it please you. I ask you, is that the fate you've chosen of your own will? You are arisen. We stand now on Bitter Black Isle, far as sea from the cove we departed. I would ask you to explore its depths. They step ashore and are immediately taken aback by the immense feeling of dread that this place gives off. Were it possible, I would not send you off with so meager an explanation. But I fear I myself do not know it better. My past, my aims in coming here, all of it is lost, as in a fog. All I know is that I, like you, was called here and am bound to stay. I sensed you in the distance and called to you for help. I knew somehow, as by instinct, that you could grant the wish of the one who dwells below. Just as I know my role here is to aid you in that pursuit. There isn't much information on the land of Bitter Black Isle. This place is a giant labyrinth that is taking many adventurers seeking glory as its victims. All who enter disappear, never to see the light of day ever again. This place is home to unspeakable monstrosities, never before seen in the mainland of Grancis. The island simply appears, fully formed, suggesting some sort of magical origin, and is similar to the Everfall in terms of style and layout. It has tight corners, dark places, giant holes and open spaces. Bitter Black Isle is also thought to be outside the plane of existence that Grancis exists in. It is always night and with a full moon, whereas there is no moon over Grancis. Furthermore, certain Arisen on the island are unaffected by the death of the dragon, unlike other Arisen living in Grancis, indicating it being outside the rules of the mainland of Grancis. The deeper one travels in the labyrinth of Bitter Black Isle, the air grows thicker and the rotting smell travels in the holes faster and farther, which may attract even more dire monsters. Bitter Black Isle contains the strongest enemies in the entire game. In addition to demons, dragons and all matter of unholy creatures, it is said that Death Incarnate haunts the labyrinth within, waiting to slay any Arisen that dares to enter its holes. One also has a chance of happening upon dead Arisen, whose bodies give their final thoughts or warnings for new visitors. 
Chad then has a flash of a former life, where he fought with a large magical mace and a shield. The bonk lord of a previous life is calling to him, and he promptly changes into a more comfortable vocation, the Mystic Knight. Orla seems to have some equipment in their inventory from previous Arisen's journeys, and Chad takes the opportunity to don some sick looking armor. I must say, the possibilities for fashion in this game are endless. He looks so cool. Chad and BJ then head on over to the Rift Stone. Chad's visions have shown him a new way to interact with it. He touches it and is suddenly within a plane outside of the mortal realm. Here, several pawns of other Arisons from across the dimensions arrive to show their willingness to aid Chad in his adventure. While Chad is basically slave shopping, I want to quickly talk about this awesome feature. I completely forgot to mention it in the last vid, but the pawn rental system is super cool. Each Arisons pawn, if the player is connected to the internet, is linked to the Rift Zone. This makes it so that other players can either spend Rift Crystals to hire them, or if they're friends on the system one is playing on, rent them for free. And after you're done with them, you can send them back to their world with a gift. After some time, Chad has found two worthy companions, and the squad composed of the Strider Nilly and the fighter Derpington venture forth onwards towards the giant door. It slowly opens and shows an epitaph. A stone slab etched with ancient stories of long lost adventurers that would try their luck in this forsaken place. Unbeknownst to Chad and Beach Jesus, they will in their adventure find several lost notes of other adventures. Back with our heroes, they have already faced several new enemies. Poison dogs, larger, more dangerous goblins, and even death itself. Death is a giant shadowy figure covered in a black cloak. He is only ever encountered on Bitter Black Isle, and is quite larger than many creatures in the realm, and hovers ominously above the ground. Death has no face, only a gaping black hole that looks back at any unfortunate soul that encounters him. I'm no fan of death in this game. Um, the enemy, not the mechanic. He has insane range as well as an insta-kill move with his scythe. His lantern allows him to cast sleep which will stun anyone within range. Death proves to be too big of a threat at the moment, so they flee after Derpington meets a tragic end by death's hand, or, or scythe to be exact. They enter a large room called the Duskmoon Tower. Welcome, good Arisen. Hmm, three days this one. A week, perhaps. A favored game of mine, guessing the lifespan of those who enter these halls. Nothing personal, mind. And rest easy, friend. Three score guesses here now have yet to hit the mark once. The person they meet is named Barak. He is an Arisen as well. However, Barak has abandoned his duty as a Dorisen. He, like other Dorisen, was called to Bitter Black Isle by some mysterious force, and found a place to his liking. His pawn is nowhere to be seen. He, as a former apothecary, has used the labyrinth as a source for rare and unusual alchemical ingredients for an unknown amount of time. Unbeknownst to Chad and BJ, he will be encountered within several locations of Bitter Black Isle. Barak proves to be quite the asset to our heroes as he sells rare items as well as being able to further upgrade gear that has been Dragonforged. Dragonforged gear is the gear that has been strengthened in Wormfire, done through slaying dragons of all kinds, which I think is a great feature since now one has two extra level ups for one's gear. Although how and why he has infinite amounts of Dragonfire so readily available is still a mystery. Chad and BJ follow the force that's pulling them, and find themselves in the Ward of Regret, a treacherous hallway full of treasure and monstrous beings. They find remnants of an old broken rift zone, alluding to something sinister happening in this place. 
Further on, past the broken reef zone, they encounter giant undead, who, as the name suggests, are the bigger and less good looking big brother of the normal undead plague in Grancis. Chad and BJ dispose of these and head on out to what can only be described as some sort of dock. The path along the wooden boards over the underground water reservoir has a chest that Chad Rook has no problem opening. It has, however, become the permanent residence of a man-eater. The man-eater is a yellow worm-like creature resembling the tentacles of an evil eye. These are dangerous and spring out like some fucked up jack-in-the-box to eat anyone that dares open the lid of its trap. Like, uh, like the mimic from Dark Souls. BJ and Neely manage to rescue Chad and they somehow manage to kill the man-eater, even though he cast an instant death spell almost finishing BJ. A broken wall and a rough tunnel leads further into the area and is infested with giant bats, which at this point really only pose as a nuisance. The further part of the ward is home to a troop of skeletons led by a skeleton brute which is a giant skeleton which deals massive damage. Fortunately, however, Chad is equipped with a larger blunt weapon, and we all know skeletons are weak to that stuff. The last room, leading to the Midnight Helix, contains several hanging bodies and a few undead and spellcasting skeletons. Our heroes are becoming accustomed to their newfound strength and dispose of the threats. They also take the opportunity to have a bit of relaxed fun. After a quick break they enter the Midnight Helix, a large oval room with wooden bridges crisscrossing the room leading up to the top. On the far wall there's an enormous being chained up, a Gore Cyclops. The trio concludes it might be beneficial to leave the chain cyclops alone and instead decide to deal with the several skeleton sorcerers and gargoyle infesting the helix. As our heroes fight their way closer and closer to the top, they notice several bodies and cages hanging from the ceiling implying that this has been some sort of torture or prison group. For me, this prison theory is further strengthened by the giant chained up Gore Cyclops. After reaching the top of the helix, Chad finds what is called the Void Key. He picks it up and he hears a strange voice. <laughs> what garden of strange delights is this? What forgotten paradise? What font of endless diversion! The darkness, the stench of blood! We stand at the merry mouth of hell itself! Was this perhaps the remnants of an old deceased arisen, wanting to give Chad his final warnings before passing on fully? He uses the lift stone Barrett gave them earlier to return to Orla. Lift stones are different from the fairy stones of Grancis. They seem to only work in Bitter Black Isle. Back with Orla, they manage their inventory and notice they've picked up something called Cursed Loot. Cursed item and loot is also scattered throughout the island. One can lift this curse during a purification ritual done by Orla. Cursed items on Bitter Black Isle come in several forms. Novelties, armors, weapons and gears all of which are available in three tiers, level 1, 2 and 3. The higher tiers generally yield better equipment, but also cost more rift crystals to get purified. Rift crystals is a type of currency that may be dropped as items, bought or obtained as quest rewards. They can also be gained by a fellow arisen hiring one's main pawn. Purification rewards include useful, rare and unusual items, and even scrolls that unlock secret augments. These rewards also include high level weapon and armor pieces that are of greater quality than the equipment one can obtain in Grancis, some of which that have magical effects and rings and bands which upgrade vocational skills to a third tier when equipped. 
When the curse is lifted of one of the stones, one has a chance of getting a rare and powerful weapon, armor, ring or potions. Whatever the item may be, it waits within the halls of Bitter Black Isle. The nature of which item one gets is directly tied to the vocation you and your pawn has and is categorized into three main ones. Vocation specific items can be classed into three types and are most often referred to as red for the melee based vocations, yellow for daggers and bow centered vocations and blue for the spellcasting vocations. The colors used in vocation icons indicate to which class the vocation belongs. Hybrid vocation symbols have two colors signifying their blend of two vocations. For example, the assassin symbol is both red and yellow, indicating the use of both melee and bows and daggers. The picture on screen shows you which vocations one should have when purifying cursed items for the specific rewards. I both love and hate this. On the one side of the spectrum, I am totally for the grind and replayability it gives the game. However, the sheer amount of luck one has to have to get every unique item from purifying is so insane that I can't even begin to explain it. I have played this game for so many hours across so many different platforms and I have yet to get every unique armor, weapon and ring. Oh well, they purify some items and venture back to the Duskmoon Tower. The path back is now inhabited by a cyclops and several goblins, which pose no real threat to the squad. There seems however to be an underlying system of death surrounding the isles. When a monster is slain, whatever it may be, they all leave behind a bloody rotting corpse that does not disappear. Back at Duskman Tower, Chad, BJ, Neely and Derpington search the area and find several doors which seem to be locked by some magical power. They take a mental note, open the door locked by the void key they acquired in the Midnight Helix, and enter the Vault of Defiled Truth. These names are so edgy. <laughs> I love it. This area is a gloomy courtyard, with maze-like passages and hard-to-reach balconies. Dead ends and dangerous foes waiting to catch unfortunate adventurers off guard. <laughs> Leave me, pray, haunt me no more. I can go no further. Chad and Beach Jesus fight the cockatrice and many hobgoblins and goblin shamans that resides in the courtyard. It is a difficult fight, but with our hero's newfound powers, they find a way to dispose of them. Beach Jesus uses an ancient technique only ever used before by Italian plumbers, yeah. and Chad focuses and becomes a magical pitching machine. The fights in this game are so awesome. I didn't mention this earlier, but the length of these fights can range from just a few seconds up to double digit minutes depending on your build and resources. And I for one, find that really cool. After defeating the cockatrice, Chad and BJ explore the area for treasures before they head on further into the labyrinth. They now find themselves in the gutter of misery. A somewhat quiet place with only a few leapworms. Leech-like creatures that, as the name suggests, 
leap onto any unlucky enough to be nearby. Before going further down, our heroes try the stairs leading up and enters the warrior's respite. This is some sort of sanctuary with another destroyed rift zone and a healing spring. A hole in the wall leads to a sort of built-in hut where Barak somehow has teleported. The squad searches the hut and robs Barak blind of his throw blasts and find the moonbeam gem in the attic. This gem is used as a key to open the magical doors back at Duskmoon Tower. Chad then pockets the gem and our heroes venture forth. The path leads them to some sort of sewer system with tons of winding corridors and dead ends. They decide to focus on the force pulling them through the labyrinth. The sewers are home to floating eyeballs, shooting lasers and camouflaged saurians. These pose no real threat to our doomsday squad and soon they find themselves in the shrine of futile truths. I believed in myself the one to end the great cycle, to free the world, yet here I reach my meager end, lost in quiet oblivion. Here they hear another fall in a recent speak before they see the mother of all Japanese adult cartoons descend from the ceiling. It's the geyser. Not even a minute into the fight, Chad is already stricken with a slow curse, and tries desperately to walk it off. All the while Nilly tries to chuck an explosive barrel at it. The spell wears off and Chad jumps over and grabs a hold of the geyser's eyeball, drugs himself and wails away. The aforementioned drugs are periapts, conquerors and demons periapts respectively. These enhance the user's attack power for one minute and can be stacked up to four times. Conqueror's periapts boosts the user's strength and the demons boosts the user's magic attack. Before long they all rally behind the magical sphere, which the geyser made but somehow damages it. The sphere melts the giant eyeball and before you know it the squad is victorious. Once the tentacle monster has been defeated, the squad is once again reunited with Barak. He says something about the rules of this place seemingly not affecting Chad, but doesn't seem to care all that much. Well, this is a surprise. Can you just come and go as you please then? Huh, I thought everyone come to this place was lost to the world outside, myself included. Oh well, as the exception what proves the rule, or so they say. Now, will you have a look? I'll see you don't regret it. The squad then heads out the gate, examines the ominous looking glowing slate and opens up a shortcut. Okay, now I want to talk directly to you. The next part is something I learned from this guy, and I have to show you guys as well because I freaking love that it's possible. And be sure to have your throw blasts. First, you need to be alone, so I've sent all my pawns away. Secondly, no lantern. Then simply run up, jump down here and stay by this side until death has circled around. Forgive me, my brothers. I take our dreams. Climb up here and face this way. Then just chuck four throw blasts at him as fast as you can. And uh, whoops. Death falls to its death. It's freaking beautiful. The reason why this works is seemingly because death has yet to notice the arisen and therefore there's some sort of extra sneak damage 
Also, this is a pretty easy way of getting a few levels in any vocation, really. Well, you do, however, have to kill the floating hentai monster first, so I guess you need to have some levels in the bag. I feel like I should also clarify that this only works once per playthrough. So if you want to do this again, you have to beat the game and start New Game Plus or enter hard mode. And if you already are in hard mode, you just change your difficulty to normal and then back to hard mode from the main menu. And then you start New Game Plus. Oh, okay, and back to the video. After making the flying death die by falling, yes, I understand the hilarity of that sentence. Chad disposes of the undead plaguing the bridge. However, the stench of their rotting corpses carries through the halls of the labyrinth and attracts an elder ogre. Chad decides to channel his inner pitching machine and goes to town on it. Even though Chad could easily destroy this poor Shrek wannabe, he decides to play with it a bit. He lures it closer and, well, what do you know, it's as clever as one would have thought. It seems that the ogres in Grancis and Bitter Black Isle share the same IQ. Chad rushes back to pick up his squad, and they venture further into the Bitter Black Labyrinth. They fight off some giant skeletons before feeling a pull towards an ominous looking door. But I would not wish the of any other. They enter a hall engulfed in constant flames with lizards also covered in fire. These are called Pyrosaurians. It's a subspecies of Saurians which dwells within the Bitter Black Isle. These Pyrosaurians prove quite formidable, but our heroes still manage to exit the battle victorious. Further on, they enter a large cathedral-like room, which is named the Pilgrim's Gauntlet. This room is full of hostile pawns. These are confused, masterless pawns. They continue to shout out how they wish to fight by the arisen side, but become hostile when approached. The corrupted pawns are able to support the main vocations, as well as the hybrid one, Magic Archer. Why this is, I am not sure. Many of the corrupted pawns also wear equipment described as beyond the rift. This further suggests that the Bitter Black Isle is outside the world of Grancis. While fighting these corrupted pawns, Chad, BJ, Nilly and Derbington can hear them shout lines like I'll waver no more and to be by your side once more arisen implying that even though they are masterless and possessed, they still have some recollection of their duty as pawns. After disposing of the corrupted pawns, Chad finds another glowing slate, and understands that these were the ones he was tasked to find all ten of. He takes a mental note and continues. He later finds a void key. And holy, where did that come from? A cursed dragon just instantly transmissions from god knows where. These putrid dragons spew foul vile gas thinking it was several different debilitations as well as rot and these time sensitive items in Chad's inventory, such as the blessed flower. Instead of a heart they have a single purple crystal in their chest. A battle ensues and Chad and the squad shows that they have become a force to be reckoned with. The fight drags on however, but Nilly, Derpington and BJ proves that they are great assets to the Arisen. Nilly fires a hail of exploding arrows on the cursed overgrown lizard, and Derpington charges in with devastating blows. All while Beach Jesus takes on the mantle of a jumping madman, swinging his giant hammer. They eventually slay the dragon, and the fire it emits, after its defeat, dragon forges some of Chad's gear. Nice. They head on back to find themselves on a bridge inhabited by harpies. However, these quickly fall to Chad's magic balls. <clears throat> I mean orbs. Chad finds another slate and they follow the stairways down. This place is called the Fortress of Remembrance. This place is a tall structure with winding stairwells going further down and deeper into the labyrinth. They find a pathway leading to a large door and head on in. Once inside they hear strange noises. What sounds like great wings flapping and... Is, is that electricity? Further in they go and see two dragon-like beasts. A worm... And a wyvern. The wyvern is one of the smaller cousins of the dragons, and are a species of the lesser dragon type, along with the dragon worm. The wyvern's heart is located on its back. Thus, if mounted when aloft, the wyvern will make strong attempts to throw the attacker off. 
Unlike their Drake cousins, the Wyverns do not breathe fire. They instead use a strong lightning-based breath attack that can throw their foes into the air. Consequently, they are significantly resistant to the thunder element. Wyverns are strong flyers and can cast spells, though these are less powerful than the worms. Unlike its cousin, the wyvern rarely flies. It is, however, a powerful spellcaster, able to repeatedly and rapidly incant strong spells such as Bowlide. Whilst the drake has an affinity to fire and the wyvern to lightning, the worm is strong with the ice element. This makes them vulnerable to fire-based spells and weapons. Defeating either of these beasts has a chance of dragon forging their recent equipment. After clearing what is named the Black Abbey, the squad then ventures forth and further down the fortress. They find a broken wrist zone and an eliminator, eliminator, which are extremely dangerous Taurus human hybrids wielding huge hammers. They deal massive damage and are a pain in the caboose in cramped places. Still, Nilly and the rest do swift work of it and continue. <laughs> On the bridge, Chad gets sloppy and gets munched by a man-eater, but luckily, Durbington has foreseen Chad's poor judgement and is quick to save him. Chad then uses the void key they found in the Pilgrim's Gauntlet and enters the Towers of Treasons Repaid. This place is similar to the Midnight Helix with winding wooden stairways held together with rope. Chad and the rest fight their way down through goblin shamans and fighting off Gore Cyclops at the bottom. They spend some time looting the area before continuing. They enter the Forsaken Cathedral. This corridor is home to giant undead who has to be the tankiest damn enemies in the entire game. <laughs> Chad gets warred by another man-eater and BJ rescues him. Then a spiral staircase leads the group down to what seems to be a safe passage, but then they meet two armored skeletons. These skeletons are the silver and golden knights of Bitter Black Isle, with both golden and silver armor reminiscent of the Chimeric armor. These skeleton warriors often fight alongside one another. However, since they are skeletons, they are quite weak to blunt damage. The golden knight is taken out quite quickly by the squad before it's the silver knight's turn. Chad has enchanted his shield with holy magic and does a perfect block, unleashing a storm of holy damage upon the knight. It begins to cast some type of spell but nearly fires a flurry of exploding bolts onto the knight and it perishes. Both the silver and golden knights are capable of resurrection if the other knight is down first. The fight is not over until both of them are taken out. Our heroes continue, loot the area and find another slate containing texts. However, the stench of their defeated foes sweep through the isle and lure forth an elder ogre. These feral beasts have proven to be quite thick in the head when fought by ledges, but in an enclosed space like this, they are quite formidable. Or rather, they can be, when not encountered by a god surrounded by three demigods. Damn it stood no chance. They follow the stairs down and fight off both undead and banshees and take a breather by the rift stone so the pawns may replenish their HP. This is a neat little mechanic I think. Finding rift stones and then letting the rift stone replenish the health of the pawns. The path ahead leads Chad through a hallway filled to the brim with skeletons. Countless have perished in this place. 
and Chad wonders what may be the source of this slaughter. <laughs> Through a door, the squad is introduced to the Dark Bishop, directly lifted from the wiki. Once a high esteemed archpriest of a holy order, the Dark Bishop was twisted by the many horrors of Bitter Black Isle into a corrupted, malformed version of his former self. The Dark Bishop carries the Archstaff Solar Providence and is a powerful spellcaster, wrapped in a protective sacred aura. He is capable of casting a magnitude of powerful spells and various forms and of incantations to obliterate the ones unfortunate enough to encounter him. He also has a pet cursed dragon as his ally, and can manipulate it to, to do his will. The squad quickly deals with the dragon in hopes of making the bishop more susceptible to damage. Everyone in the squad does their part beautifully. Beach Jesus uses the ancient bounce and bonk strat handed down by generations. Derpington follows through and slashes the bishop where the sun doesn't shine. Nilly is relentless with her firecracking arrows and Chadwick is once again a human pitching machine. While the team is ganking the poor bishop, Chad notices an incantation circle forming around him. His spider senses tingle and he books it out of there, but not fast enough to not feel the effects of the spell. Phew, he thinks to himself, dodge the bullet on that one. The squad then finishes off the bishop, and the door leading forward opens by some mysterious force. I really like this fight. If you for some reason have trouble killing the bishop, he is quite weak to both dark and physical damage. He also has a chance, if you take too long after killing the dragon, to resurrect it and thus making the fight even longer than first anticipated. Also the design of the bishop is awesome, although I wish they would have done something a bit different than just retexturing the lich. Chad and his crew then ventures through the gate they had just opened and speaks to Barak. This little island and what lies beneath it are a pretty mess, don't you think? I've done my share of exploring, and all over this place appears in no map or text I've ever seen. Even the halls that link one chamber to the next are mad. The work of some diabolic magic like is not. A place so steeped in rancor. Just begs for conquest, doesn't it? Gets my juices flowing. After a quick chat, they head on further into the labyrinth, into the Rotwood Depository. Chad decides to prepare and enchants the whole squad with holy magic. The enemies they find here are called wraiths. These are ghosts with a red hue whose attacks are kind of like those of other ghosts. They can possess their victims, draining their health, as well as instantly send an already unconscious bond back to the rift. The possession attack is especially dangerous when the victim is at low health. At high health, the onset and damage is slow and rather weak, however. Wraiths have a chance of inflicting different debilitations on the player, or their pawns, by charging through them like a bullet. These are debilitations like Drenched and Curse. Like other incorporeal enemies like ghosts, wraiths have a high resistance against dark and are quite weak against holy magic. They cannot be damaged by physical attacks unless they are possessing either a pawn or the arisen. I am a bit ambivalent of the wraiths. On one hand I really like the versatility they force us as players to embody, but at the same time they are a pain in the ass to fight. Let's just say we have a love-hate relationship. Further on, they encounter a rather magic resistant Saurian. Unfortunately, though, it is not resistant to being fucking ganked. After some time spent looting, our heroes find what looks like a kitchen of sorts. It's inhabited by a pack of wraiths and Saurians, which proved to be somewhat of a challenge. This kitchen area is interesting, however. It looked like this used to be a safe place where other Arisens perhaps used this as a sanctuary alongside their pods when exploring the isle before being overrun by monsters. Well, that's that's just my headcanon though. I'm just I'm just freeballing here. 
Further on, Chad encounters yet another Eliminator. And while trying to get to a better location for fighting it, Chad notices that an Elder Ogre has been summoned as well, alongside Skeleton Sorcerers. This is a cramped place, similar to a prison of sorts. Chad quickly disposes of the Sorcerer, but finds himself being gnawed on by the Ogre. Luckily, he is able to pop a potion before meeting his doom between those wretched teeth. After finally escaping the Ogre's clutches, he is pummeled by the Eliminator, who prepares for a one-shot on a now knocked down Chad. I'm going to kill you! Beach Jesus comes to the rescue and fires an arrow straight to the Eliminator's head. Chad then notices some sort of cauldron and activates it. It gives up some magical light which seems to damage both the Ogre and the Eliminator. The fight continues and our heroes fight valiantly. Chad once again gets choked and this time he perishes. Luckily he was carrying a wake stone, which are red heart shaped stones that can resurrect the Arisen or any human ally if they die. Chad manages to off the Eliminator with a combo of the Runa Sigil, which forms a barrier around the caster that harms his foes, and the Italian style of Jump and Bunk. Shortly after, the Ogre falls as well. Onwards to the Forgotten Hall, another deadly fight ensues. A Lich hovers towards the team while summoning undead, who all promptly fall. However, the stench of their rotten corpses attracts some heinous beings. Garm. They are huge, muscular, wolf-like, quadrupedal beasts that can be encountered in packs of two or three, or as solitary individuals. Although we all know that wolves hunt in packs. Garm are necrophagous creatures. This means that the stench of death and rotten corpses attracts them. A chaotic fight ensues, and after some frantic fighting, the Garm are gar go. Nailed it. I am quite ambivalent to the whole randomly spawning enemies of Bitter Black Isle. I don't really know what to think. They add a huge amount of challenge when suddenly spawning during or after a big fight, and can cause quite a bit of chaos when trying to manage one's securities. I like it. And I hate it. I can't stress enough how many times a random enemy spawn has destroyed a run for me when trying to run through the aisles and then being forced back to an autosave 20 minutes ago. Remember to save often, children. Our heroes continue and find a huge grand hall with one chained gore cyclops on each side, with the ground surrounding them being inhabited by corrupted pawns. In my opinion, this is a pretty challenging room. It's dark, full of hard-hitting enemies, and if you somehow manage to damage the Gore Cyclops change up, they'll break free and join the fight. We can see Chad and the squad take on the pawns as well as one of the Gore Cyclops, but their resources are starting to dry up and they decide to make a tactical retreat. The force pulling Chad Rook deeper into the labyrinth is telling him that he'll need all the help he can get. The squad enters the Bloodless Stockade, who harbors a door leading into the Arisen's refuge. Here, Chad finds another moonbeam gem, reminding him of the mysterious doors in the Duskmoon Tower. I'll show you a little trick there later in the video. He talks to Barak, who begins reminiscing of his life and his mortality. It's been many a year since I parted ways with my heart, and I can't say as I miss it much. Were I still mortal, being stranded on this island hell might have caused me some bother. Chad decides to manage his inventory a bit before continuing. This refuge, as well as the other refuge found earlier, contains a resting bench if one needs to restore some stamina and health, as well as a notice board containing different quests for the path ahead. Further on, they dispose of another eliminator, as well as some corrupted pawns. Chad loots the area gets jumped on once again, and continues towards the force. On his way further into the Bitter Black Isle, he sees a ghost. This is a former Arisen. He vanishes and Chad hears a voice. In memory of Gretchen.
silent hearted, dragon forged. With hair of gold and wheel of tempered steel. You ransomed me from a village burnt to ash, instilled life and fight. Dearest mentor, I commend you now to rest eternal. Your servant, bereft of master and memory, I keep now my son. She lives on, your mirror in soul and body both, and I will not lose her as we have lost you. This I swear before your empty grave. After a speech with longer art pauses than Obama, death appears once again. I guess getting tossed into a waterfall didn't really do the trick. They decide to flee from death, but instead destroys an elder ogre that randomly spawns in front of them. They enter a door leading to the spare yard of scant mercy and hears a conversation between what I think is the Arisen and someone else. Offer your beloved in forfeit and I shall see your will done. Choose? How am I to choose? No matter my answer, the price is death! Hollow choice! Who am I to stand as arbiter of two lives? Of two lives. What would you have me do? You brought me here! You! If this be the will of the gods, the order of the world, then damn the lot of them! I'll tear the whole of it asunder! Very well. If that be your wish, I shall claim my price. Stop! No! This is where we start to get a bit more information on what really happened here. With an Arisen trying to save his beloved, the dragon holding her hostage, and the Arisen cursing the cycle. We will go even deeper into the lore of this DLC later, in its own chapter so to speak, but, but just keep this in mind. Our heroes then encounter a large blue knight looking fellow, which is named the Living Armor. They have similar movesets to the fighter and mystic knight vocations, they pose a considerable threat and are in the first phase vulnerable to physical damage, but once the armor comes off they're only vulnerable to magic damage. So it's advisable to destroy their armor with physical attacks and then pummel them with some enchanted gear or straight up magic. Or make them fall to their deaths, either from a ledge by the entrance or by the cliff edge of the arena. I guess no one is safe from gravity in this game. I must say that these enemies are extremely cool looking to me. The kid in me simply loves the design of the living armor. As well as being insanely strong with both fighter and mystic knight abilities, its resistances are also pretty cool. Making it a foe one has to either have a well-rounded team to take down, or have the ability to use both physical and magical attacks oneself. The fight drags on and Chad even has to use a wake stone. They are pretty handy. However, they manage to take down the armor after some time. They find another slate and head on into the fallen city. The Fallen City has a number of houses, small streets, and easily accessible roofs containing several chests and different loot. Chad and the squad carefully follow the streets of the Fallen City, and on their way towards the giant gate, they hear several memories of a past recent's life. You have been chosen. So say, the worm pries the heart from my breast. I was made arisen, known to the dragon, and bound to hunt it. It is a fate I embrace. What use have I for a heart left hollow? In a world without sweet Grete, my mentor, my mother, my beloved. 
I live only to see the dragon claim to have slain. I will see its scaly hide stripped from bone by my hands ere I rest. Arisen, bearer of the dragon's mark, undying corpse, enjoined to make your will manifest. If my voice reaches you, heed me well. The Arisen, the Seneschal, the whole cursed world, all is but an illusion. A meaningless refrain, a hollow echo. What sense is there in giving one's life for these falsehoods? I damn them all. And I will not cease in my destruction until the last senseless cycle is broken, the last wall rent to dust. I feel it in the marrow of my bones. Some force beckons me beyond. I will make for it, though my body fail along the way. The ghosts and voices lead Chad and the crew towards the force that has been pulling them through the labyrinth all this time. And they enter the Beater Black Sanctum, where another voice calls out to them. This is Damon. Damon is a former Arisen from countless lifetimes ago. He refused to make a choice when confronting the dragon, and thus the dragon transformed him into this abhorrent beast, mad from losing his loved ones. It is believed that Damon was created out of the previous Arisen's sheer hatred for the destiny he felt was thrust upon him. Damon fed himself with ill thoughts for countless centuries, feeding on poor Arisen who met their doom in this dungeon as well as his own host. His true strength is unknown, given the incredible amount of corrupted and ill thoughts and feelings Diamond has consumed over the millennia, it will be safe to call it the embodiment of mankind's chaos, humanity's desire to end the infinite cycle. Despite Diamond's hulking size, he is a powerful and agile fighter with incredible magical affinity and brute force. He will use smart tactics to lure the party into disarray, which makes him a tough opponent. Diamond is quite resistant to both physical and magical attacks, although as if this was Call of Duty one should go for headshots, that's his greatest weakness. Halfway through battle, Diamond will begin to change up his pace, beginning to cast deadly combinations of magic that may deal serious damage to both the Arisen and their pawns. He also has this special move, 
where he creates a dangerous void below him, pulling whatever living being in the vicinity closer and inevitably down to their demise and out of this world. This fight is so cool. This area, this boss room, it all looks so great. You, you can tell that I'm super biased of this game. I, this is just a love letter at this point. During the fight, Diamond can be heard speaking directly to the reason fighting him, telling him basically that there's no use in fighting and anyone trying to fight the cycle is doomed to fail. The party proves to Damon that his reign is over and after some time they manage to force him to his knees with Derpington dealing the killing blow. Nice. He falls to the ground and light begins to burst out of his chest. This is the Arisen Ash. Still hearted kinsman. You have my thanks. To destroy is simpler than to create, and harder still is to see aught to fruition, to end it rightly. The infinite chain is yours arisen, to grant measure, to give what shape you will. And I, at last, can step beyond its span. My brethren, dearest Aura, Chad and the crew loot the area before leaving the sanctum and a cutscene follows. I fancied myself a strong man. Strong enough to protect someone. Strong enough to love someone. I longed to prove it to myself as much as any other. Longed to show that I could give aught back and not simply take. And yet, in that moment, I chose to cast it all away. Though I cursed the world, what was writ true in my soul was an apology to you and our master who fostered a soul within you. You have not left to prove, my sweet, for I have known your love, and know it still. I have e'er wished nothing more than to share in your world, be it within the endless chain or beyond. Let us find our place, together. I promise we will try to make sense of this in just a few minutes. I feel as if freshly awakened from some long dream. Yet I heard clear each word exchanged between you and the one who possessed me. I remember them still. That woman. She too was named Aura. Perhaps it was that chance bond that led her spirit to me. And through me she called to you. To one whose strength of will outmatched the master of this place. Arisen or no, my own will seems a guttering candle to your son. I shall remain here a while, I think. To contemplate the meaning of our meeting here. I must believe my claiming this body, my calling you here, held some meaning. After defeating Damon, several changes happen to the Isles. New enemies spawn in new locations, chests hold new loot and the enemies have become even tougher. Jadrook learns that Damon, even though he has just purged from the Isle, is still alive. Therefore the squad decides to take one last trick through the Bitter Black Labyrinth, with once and for all defeating the incarnation of corrupted thoughts in mind. I love this mechanic. When defeating the main boss of the DLC, the whole aisle simply levels up, closing off previously opened shortcuts and forcing you through once again. 
All right, I don't love the fact that the shortcuts are closed off, but yeah. Still, it's not all good vibes. It does feel a bit like a shortcut to simply force the player through the same dungeon a second time to really experience a full DLC instead of unlocking a completely new area or something of that nature. However, it's not the exact same. Enemies, as previously mentioned, have been buffed considerably and scattered around the aisles. We'll encounter several beefier enemies in places they never would have been before. I like to fantasize that Damon being defeated made the countless beasts of Bitter Black Isle less scared and thus decided to come out of hiding. Our heroes fight their way through countless enemies, now spawning new locations, as well as finding new loot. Even the bosses that once were defeated have come back. However, none of these new enemies pose any real threat to the now bitter black veterans of Chadbrook and BJ's squad. Back in the Duskmoon Tower, I can finally show you the neat little trick that'll save you the Boombin gems. Make sure you're alone since the pawns have a habit of breaking stuff. Pick a door, pick up a barrel and place it on one side. I can't quite remember if the sides really matter since I seem to remember doing it on both sides. Pick up another barrel and start jumping towards the corner of the door. After placing an object, it seems to not have any collision for a short amount of time and then if you hold another barrel, for example, and start jumping inside of the first barrel, it will suddenly get the collision back and pop, be right through the door. This only works with characters that are kind of tall, so the shorter ones just bounce off and out of the barrel. This way you can bypass all the doors without using a single moonbeam gem. Neat. Alright, back to the story. The trek goes through familiar rooms now filled to the brim with several new powerful foes. However, the need for void keys are luckily now void. <laughs> they enter the chasm with a geyser and slaughters it. <laughs> Further on, they fight a ton of eliminators as well as liches, garms, and knights. Back with the Dark Bishop and his pet dragon, our heroes make quick work of him. It also helps tremendously that he's glitched himself in the doorway. <laughs> they continue, dodge death yet again, and enters the Grand Hall just before the Fallen City. Here there's now two dragons, which fall quickly. Now onto the final stretch. The Fallen City is now home to a Thunder Wyvern, several living armors and eliminators. Chad and his team fight relentlessly against these formidable foes for quite some time, before heading into the final chamber to fight Daemon once again. The four warriors attack the great beast with a ferocity only ever before seen in Americans during Black Friday. And Damon once again faces defeat by the hands of Chad Brook and his three musketeers. However, and I find this extremely cool. You think you've finally beaten the biggest baddie of the game once and for all, but then he starts coughing and a freaking face erupts from his abdomen. Flawless. Damon's final form awakens and thus begins the most unforgiving fight in Dragon's Dogma. At least in my opinion. I had more attempts on this than I'd like to admit trying to get all three pawns through alive, as well as not abusing the periaps Chad has been chowing down on through the whole of Bitter Black Isle. Second form Damon ups his repertoire when it comes to attacks. 
One of the coolest in my opinion, but also the hardest to dodge, is this attack where he summons two large arms and either swipes across the arena or tries to give you a hug. It looks awesome and has this immense aura of unbeatable over him I feel. The fight makes both Chad and the gang struggle, but they all are able to deal substantial damage to the giant beasts. However, whenever Chad tries to climb to deal some damage up close, Damon creates a fiery force field which deals massive damage to Chad. After some time, Damon unleashes his ultimate attack, the Rift Vortex. Here I noticed something I've never seen before. Chad's Great Cannon goes through the other Great Cannon orb before targeting Damon. I've never seen this and this helped out tremendously during the last stretch of the fight. Unfortunately all three pawns start getting dragged into it before Chad can stun Damon out of the attack. Or, well, drag this is a stupid way of putting it. All of them rushed B and got bodied. Now it's only up to Chad to end this. Damon has now vanquished all pawns and starts some sort of incubation. Chad sees this as an opportunity and buffs himself, and throws several high velocity magic orbs towards Damon and finally deals the finishing blow. Damon's awakened form falls to the ground and rots away. Uncovering a human figure whilst an ominous voice talks in the background in an unknown language. The body is the body of the Arisen Ash, finally laid to rest after centuries of rage and hatred. Finally, we'll talk a bit about the lore. The Dragon's Dogma wikis, don't fail me now! If this wasn't obvious from the appearance after defeating Damon's first form, the former Risen Ash is in fact the person who, after a curse, became Daemon. He was only a young boy when his hometown was destroyed much like Asardis in the beginning of the game, and Ash was subsequently taken care of by an Arisen and her pawn. This was the Arisen Greta and her pawn Aura. Greta later became a sort of mother figure for the now orphaned Ash, and he looked up to her as his mentor. His love for Greta was unquestionably deep. The Arisen Greta managed to defeat the dragon, but somehow died in the battle against the Seneschal, and thus became a dragon herself. Aura, now without an Arisen, decided to return to Ash. These two later developed a great love for each other. Ash, on some later point, it's unknown exactly how long after, became an Arisen himself. However, fate has its way of being incredibly vile at times, and the dragon Ash was tasked to slay was his former mentor Greta. Greta, who had fallen by the Seneschal's hand and subsequently taking the Ash's heart, making him an Arisen. The now dragon Greta took Ash's beloved Aura as hostage and gave him a choice. Sacrifice his beloved or slay her the dragon, the one he used to love as his own mother. This makes Ash curse the whole world and the immensely difficult choice he was forced to make. Ash curses everything and rejects everything, not wanting to give in to the fate he was given. However, Greta the dragon slew Aura and cursed Ash, turning him into Daemon. Cursed to live outside the realm of the common world, which matched Ash's despair and hatred. Aura's spirit, after death, inhabited another Arisen and ventured forth to seek redemption for Ash and for them all. Oh my god, I love this game so much. And this story, full of love and despair, it's so full of passion. It's so clear to me that the developers really love their work during this DLC. Or that's at least the feeling I'm getting. I, of course, have used the Dragon's Dogma wikis heavily in researching for this video, and I will link some of the more interesting articles in the description. Still, there's plenty more theories surrounding the lore of Bitter Black Isle. Still, I really like this short synopsis of why Damon is the way he is. The community have pieced together the stories given to the player by Olra, Barak, the Slates, Damon himself, and the remnants of former Arisen strewn about the Isle. And this is what I really love about games like this. With a bit of ambiguous storytelling, it forces the players, in my opinion, to piece the story together themselves, which gives way for the community to come together. I have in this video tried to compress it as well as I could, and also try to pique your interest into maybe researching a bit yourself. Also, if you're interested in Dragon's Dogma lore, I can't stress enough how good the Rifts channel is. 
so you should go check him out. He's a swell guy. I feel like all throughout the whole of Bitter Black Isle you can feel the dread, despair and hatred coming from the sanctum of Daemon. I like to think the quest marker, canonically, is a force pulling us towards the hatred and the common fate shared with Ash, also being an arisen. Every time I play this I learn something new. I commend the makers of this game for creating such an awesome and deep game with the time constraints and setbacks that they had. Thank you so much for watching. I really enjoyed taking a deeper dive into the lore than I am used to and I had fun reading the wikis and figuring out new things on each page. Also a huge thank you to Spooky Derpington and Dee Hill for letting me borrow their palms. They were immensely helpful. I'll link their channels in the description. Although I'm pretty sure you already know them. These videos do take some time to record, write and edit, so if you like this and this type of content, I would greatly appreciate it if you subscribed and commented. I'll let the slates Chad picked up play in the background while the video is ending, so if you want to, you can pause and read them. Thank you again for watching and take care. Thank you.